Okay, we're going to go ahead and start the meeting after Ms. Holly gets this last signature, and then if we missed anybody that hasn't signed up, just come to the desk. Holly will be sitting. Ms. Holly Hennies will be sitting on the left-hand side here. Just come up and tell her your name, and then she will write your name down so you get a time to speak. So we're going to go ahead and start our meeting, if that's okay. So we're going to board. Call to order the June 7, 2017 Board of Commissioner meeting. Please silence your cell phones, your pagers, and other electronic communication devices. We really appreciate it. First, we'll have a moment of silence and then the Pledge of Allegiance led by Commissioner Busgrude. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Next, we are going to review and approve the agenda. Board, do we have a motion? Yeah, so before you do it, people want to go in the other room. Um, let's do this, George, and then. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, was there a motion so by moved. DeSanto? Second. Second by LaCroix. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Um, next, we'd like to make an announcement. Holly, is that okay if they, they go into the, the overflow so people don't have to stand up into our commission Absolutely. chambers? Absolutely. There is a... Um, office to the left here the left door if you need to sit down it does have a TV and it has this on a monitor if you'd like to watch that if you don't feel like you can stand I think um, we have a lot of people that want to speak today what we're gonna do is first do a presentation by our highway department uh, superintendent uh, mr. Wilsey and then our South Dakota transportation Department would be Mr. Joel Dunt, Junt, and he's going to give his information. Our federal highway representative isn't here today. A congressional delegation, if I'm correct, Mr. Kasai from Mr. Thune's office is here. Pace law representatives, Mr. Van Norman. Thank you, sir. And then we'll have public testimony. And when we do the public testimony, what we're going to do is everybody, if that's okay, we're going to time you and you get three minutes each to speak. So if you decide that um, Joe wants Dan to take his time and Dan gets six minutes then and, and Dan can, or Joe can say, I'll have forfeit my time to Dan, my three minutes. So you can forfeit your time to some of the people of your representatives that you want, but um, you get three minutes each to speak and do your um, proposal or non-opposed um, speech on what you want to tell us, okay? And then it's... And then at the end, it's a possible board decision or a continuance, depending on the information and if we're ready to move forward. So, um, Mr. Tom Wilsey, you're up, sir. Good evening, Commissioners. Tom Wilsey, Highway Department. Um, Ms. Penick, the South Rockford Road Project, we're just... I give you some. Uh, there. The, pro the project length, proposed project is 10.3 miles in length. It commences from the Rochford Road, just uh, west of Rochford, and goes down to where the asphalt starts on the South Rochford Road. Just give me just a second. Um, sure thing. Commission, it's right in your book, the first pages, um, if you want to follow through with this. One more thing, Tom. Miss um, uh, Hennings, Miss Holly Hennings, will call your name when it's time for the public to speak, um, and she will announce your name, and then you can come up and speak when it's your time, and that's after the presentations. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, folks, for your time today. Mr. Wilsey, please. Okay. Total length of the project is 10.3 miles. Here's a. We have a little timeline. This is a very abbreviated timeline for the project. In May 18th of 04, this was approved by 
for the sur surface transportation program. And Safety Lou in 2005 uh, gave us the appropriations for this project. There, an agreement was signed in six and we started the project, started the pre preliminary work for the project. Um, cultural resources were studied and all the environmental was started. Um, during this process in 09, uh, DOT decided they could not do the EA, so they told us we had to hire somebody. Then in 10, we were told that uh, with the cultural resources and studies, we had to go to an EIS, an Environmental Impact Statement, instead of an Environmental Assessment because of uh, additional studies that need to be done. Um, the NEPA Notice of Intent, uh, na oh, that's National Environmental Protection. Protection. Notice of Intent was signed and and in 14, the bridge was split away from the project. And in 15, agreement for the county to maintain the right of way within the authority through the PACE law was signed. These blue lines that I've got in this are during the EIS. Because in September of 15, a new roadway width was adopted. It went from a 36 foot road to a 28 foot road, which reduced the in in footprint on the project so we could go back to an environmental assessment instead of an e uh, environmental impact statement. This much facilitated the completion of the environmental portion of this project. July of 16, Federal Highway Administration, final EA, and the, they submitted the final EA and the finding of no significant impact or FONSI. From there, now we have to move forward. Um, there, actually, in this project, there are two, two projects. There's the South Rochford Road Bridge and the construction of the road. As I said, in, in 14, they split the bridge away from the, from the roadway. So this structure is a timber stringer on, on timber and rock cribbing back walls. Um, the bridge is starting to deteriorate. Uh, this is all the information from our bridge inspections on this. The timber stringers are in pretty fair condition. There's some damage due to flows, but the cribbing and the abutments are deteriorating. Several of these, these timbers are starting to rot, allowing spilling of some of the rocks. This is a picture of the southwest wing wall. Uh, that bottom timber, you can walk up there and break chunks off of it. It's very rotten. New bridge alignment. We're not going to build the new, new bridge in the same location. Um, the new bridge will be approximately 45 feet west of the, of the old structure. Uh, where that little circle is, there's a stake that's showing the center of the abutment of the new structure. Uh, this is looking right down the line for the alignment of the new structure. The anticipated new structure will be a precast concrete arch with finished end walls. Um, this is all yet to be determined completely. This is going to be handled by the state of South Dakota. Start of the project area. Um, this is for the roadway project. There's very little work to be completed here except lining up with the new bridge. The Mickelson Trail crosses our road about, um, about 400 feet from the Rochford Road. This, you can see it on the left there and the, on the right hand side where it crosses is between those two signs. Um, there's some road alignment due to the proposed new bridge alignment, but otherwise the grade will be pretty much the same. Icebox Canyon. Icebox Canyon is about seven, a little over seven tenths of a mile in length. Uh, the reason we call it Icebox is because of the lack of sunlight and the water running through there. It doesn't free, it freezes up in the winter and we don't get much sunlight to melt the ice off. There's an active water channel in the, this, as you can see in the inset, that's just to the right there where the circle is. 
Uh, that is the creek running down our ditch. Uh, we have problems with washboards and frosties in this area. In July of 08, the roadway was washed out during a large rainstorm. Uh, this is just one location of several locations along the road where this happened. This took us a couple, several months to repair and replace parts of it. Once you get out of icebox, there's an area they call the Fens area. These are areas identified as regions where a specific sphagnum moss grows. Regions have been choked down to get the water to flow through culverts when the road was constructed. Um, a lot of this area, uh, we are looking at doing some special work so we can allow this water to flow through the road and, and uh, therefore allow the fence to go back to its original locations. Um, this will be done by <coughs> taking the road out, putting in a layer of rocks to allow the water to flow through, and uh, then building the road on top of the rocks. This is one of the outlets where the culvert is just, you can see it's down to about an eight foot wide area. The fens, the reason of the fens with the special sphagnum moss is the water is acidic and it promotes the growth of that sphagnum moss. Um, it's a rather, it's an endangered type of moss, so they're really happy that we can do something to help this. Current roadway width is about 26 feet. Our pro proposed roadway width, as approved in the environmental assessment, is to be 28 foot, finished top. Uh, it's just a, doesn't look like much of a change here, but it's a major change for our, for our maintenance on it. There's about 5.6 miles from the, from the um, Icebox Canyon up to an area known as Pace Slaw. It's approximately 1.8 miles of South Rockford runs through this area. Uh, in 2015, we had an agreement with, which identifies the county as the primary authority and responsible entity for the road, con the road construction and maintenance. It also recognizes that the South Rochford Road is a public access road and shall remain open <coughs> all through traffic. In the Pace Law, that on the left side of this picture here is a new um, buffalo fencing that has been put in up there. With the 28 foot, it does not intrude with any right, intrude with the uh, fence. We can keep all the work inside the fence. Um, this will not require any additional uh, um, acquisition of right of way within that area. South of Pace Law, there are private properties with minimal change to the alignment in, this re in these regions. There will be some flattening of a few curves. The adjustment to improve the super elevation of the highway, but it's minimal. There are about five places where we are flattening curves, including in the uh, Icebox Canyon, where we're making some adjustments to the grades. End of the project area is where the asphalt starts now. Um, this is actually in, still in South Rockford Road, which in turn, you follow it down for about two miles and you're on Deerfield Road. This is where the money starts. Uh, earmarking. The earmark funding that is available as of now, well, original funding for the roadway was 10.088 million, including the county match. Expended to date is 1.537 million. Uh, available for the roadway is 8.583 million. Of this, 7 million, 34,000 is earmarked and the rest is the county match, the 1.5, about 1.55. Any expenditure over that 8.583 
is sole responsibility of the county. If we can come in under that, we can save the, we can save a little money for ourselves. Estimated project costs. The bridge is a separate project, as I said. Estimated cost of the structure is about three hundred ninety-two thousand. Project funds are eighty twenty funds, which means eighty percent by by federal and twenty by county. So our portion of this cost is about seventy-eight thousand four hundred dollars. The roadway project. I estimated this project in two ma two ways. The EA says it has to be a finished surface. So I figured it one way with an eight, four inch asphalt mat surfacing, the other with a stabilized base and asphalt surface treatment or a blotter surface. <coughs> Estimated costs with the asphalt, I've got nine, $9, million well, nine million ninety thousand was my estimate. County portion would be 2.055 million. The blotter is a little, different, little lower. We can do stabilized base and uh, a modified gravel under the in the base and uh, then do a county blot uh, blotter system on it, which is basically like a chip seal with, with a little larger aggregate. Uh, it would be two lifts of the blotter. This I estimate at 8.323 million. County portion of this would be 1.502 million. I am bringing this up because I feel that the blotter is the better choice here. With the traffic counts we have now, we can uh, live with a blotter quite, a, quite for quite a while, I feel. Um, if the traffic counts ever get high enough, up in the 800 to 1,000 range, we might have to look at putting, in, putting a two inch mat on it. But right now, with the traffic counts, this would be sufficient. <coughs> um, this is about all that I'm going to give. This is a for the construction of the project. Got any questions for me, please? Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Um, do you want to ask Mr. Wilson questions now or let everybody speak and then have the board speak? What's the wish of the board? What's going to be easier? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, Might answer some questions for later. Put your finger up. Mr. Wilson. <laughs> yes. Madam Chair. Sir. Um, the blotter surface, it's a rougher surface, correct? To start with, yes. After traffic gets on, it does smooth out some. So being a rougher surface, it would provide a safer surface during winter. Would that be correct? It probably would, yes. Thank you. Okay. Board? I got a question. Yes. Tom, Commissioner, you say <coughs> doing the blotter would save, what is it? Over 700,000. 700,000. But what happens if you have to come back and do that two inch mat that you were talking about? It comes later? about, that costs about 200,000 a mile. So we're talking $2 million project if you're putting the, two mat, the mat on. You do the mat later on. That is the, that, yeah, I'm saying that eight to 10 years, 20 years from now, we might have to do it. It all depends on the traffic counts and how the blotter holds up. We have several blotter roads in this county. Um, Neck Yoke Road, part of it is. Um, the road, um, Longview Road out east of town is part of its blotter. We have them all over this county. It's, you've probably driven over several and didn't know it. Yeah. I'm just, I was just looking at the cost difference between now and later if something was changed. You know, we're looking at 700 now to 2 million later on. That's, that's kind of what I'm looking at. That, that was my only question. Thanks. Thank you. Um, mine's the traffic count. How long does it take? Is it going to be, be before you think? that that road, because it'll increase the traffic, obviously, because it'll be chip sealed or asphalt. Um, do you think that traffic is going to, that traffic count's going to change in the next 10 years, the next 20 years? I mean, so you do a road, should we just do the asphalt 
because of what we think that road's going to be? Or should we chip seal because we're thinking for the future it'll take 10 years or 20 years before we get that traffic count up high enough to make it worth? Um, My estimate here is once we pave it, probably the traffic count's going to double from more than double from what it is now. Okay. Um, that would still not quite warrant an asphalt mat. Um, so, Mr. Wilson, make an estimate of sorry. when that will be. It'd be seven to ten years minimum. So, Mr. Wilson, can you put asphalt over the top of chip seal if we decide later that it needs to be? We do it all the time. Okay, that's my my question. <laughs> I didn't know if you could, if you had to tear it all up and no. do something different or put a different mat on it or... Okay, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Busgrove, please. And, and I think maybe Lloyd asked the question and I'm not sure I got... I was listening or didn't get the answer. What's the difference in maintenance between the bladder and, and the asphalt road then per year? Bladder, would, we would have to do another uh, mat on it sooner, a uh, chip seal over it sooner. Um, Cost of maintenance of a new new road, it'd be about a wash, very honestly. Um, Any difference in snow removal? Might I mean, be little, I, I, I know that you gotta go over it the same amount of times probably, but is there a better chance of, of breaking up a bladder road then? Like I said, we have several of them in this county. We don't have problems with it. The only thing that a blotter might have an issue with is being a little rougher, it might hold some snow a little better, a little more. We'd have to work at it, maybe have to use a little more uh, grit on the site, but that's it. Like I said, we have several blotters in this county. We have no problem with that. Thank you. Commission? Any other questions for Mr. Wilsey? For now. Mr. LeCroy? Mine were, were on the same lines of, of Ron's about the maintenance, and, and I'm just concerned, you know, we've done a lot of talk about the drainage and the heaving and so forth, and that, I guess that's... Okay. I, I want to make I, sure that this is all included and in, in going from the blotter to, to overlay that we're still going to fix those problems. All right, let me, let me go back to that a little bit here. Let me back up. Oops. Uh, slide I was talking about the fens areas here. Yeah. That is an area where we've got our worst fr frost heaves is in this area. There's about a mile and a half where it's the worst. Um, by the work that we're going to do to try to stabilize, to protect the fence areas, some of that will take care of most, a lot of those frosties. Other, fro other areas where we have it, it's been identified, we'll do some work to try to stabilize those frosties. Okay. <clears throat> now go back one slide. Back one? Or maybe forward one where you had the, the road breakaway. That, that, yeah. Which one? <laughs> Is that one? Oh. How are, can you explain to me how we're going to fix this? Or we're pro you, we're probably going to, I'm sorry. How you are going to fix this, sir. Well, we, that is one of the things that our designers will have to do. About all I can come up with is they're going to have to armor the shoulder in some manner. Um, we can do it with gabion baskets, which are rock-filled, um, what metal ba uh, yeah, wire sure baskets and build retaining little walls underneath the shoulder to protect it. It could be done with rip wrap and some concrete um, to kind of grout it and protect it. There are several ways. We'll have to look at the costs of all of these and figure out which is the most cost effective and most effective for us. That's going to be part of the design process. One other question, please. Yes, sir. As I was reading through some of these reports, they were talking about maybe some of the trees would be need thinned out, and would that help with getting the sunlight in? There's talk about that. Um, 
we are planning on getting rid of some of the trees, thinning some of them out. We'll probably have to work with the Forest Service to okay. appro get approval on which ones we can and how many we can take out. That's all part of the design process. Okay, thank you. We are working with Weed and Pest right now to get some of this taken care of prior to the construction even starting. I guess that was one of my points because Weed and Pest does a lot of that in the hills as far as going through and thin and out around the roadways to prevent the dangers of the travel. So this, that is, this is one road that they're looking at okay. right now. Thank you. Thank you. So Mr. Wilsey, is there any way to put culverts or anything underneath there? So have you directed the, redirected the water at all because of the slough off the hill and everything that basically runs off onto that edging of that road? That, culv that stream crosses this road so many times in this three quarters of a mile. That there is it's just kind of hard to control where where you're going to take it. And that was I, I was with Lloyd when um, I went on this road with the sheriff before just driving it when we were um, talking to Mr. Van Norman on Pace Law. Just went up there for a drive at that time, and then Mr. Wilsey, you and Holly, me and Lloyd went up there, and they did. There's some water there, not that much water, but that was my concern. Is how are you really going to fix that? But you had said that the baskets and the rocks in the basket, I know that'll slow down that water. I don't know if it'll detour from going underneath the road, but that'd be my biggest concern is the erosion that's and the maintenance that that corner is going to cause us it's this um, corner, out of this whole It's project. this corner and two others that are the problem. Yes, sir. But I'm going to trust that you've done this long enough. And <laughs> <laughs> Thank been you, around sir. it for a few years. Yes, sir, you have. Thank you. I just want to bring attention. That bridge, 1940s, that's 77 years old. That's correct. It's almost your age. <laughs> <laughs> almost as old as Buster. <laughs> Sorry, Lloyd. I just wanted to bring that to the attention because we talked about the ages of some of these bridges that we have. Yes. You know, that's, that's quite a long life. Yes. Looking at the decking, I would have to say that that deck has pr probably been replaced, but I don't think that substructure has. Okay. Thank you. Board, any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wilsey. <coughs> Mr. Joel Gent, please. Board, you should have the requirements and el of the eligibility for repurposing from Mr. Junt's presentation in front of you. That was an extra that was Holly printed for you. Okay. You need to look at that. Okay. Evening, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, Joel John, Deputy Secretary, South Dakota Department of Transportation. Uh, my presentation tonight um, is really just going to uh, highlight some of those major points that I provided to you in correspondence here this past week. Uh, it looks like Tom and I did not do a very good job collaborating, so there's some numbers in here, and, and we'll just go th through those very quickly since I know you got a lot of people that would like to speak tonight. So as we've been uh, working with you on this project for a number of years, um, Repurposing was a topic that you had addressed a couple months ago. You had submitted um, a request to the, our congressional folks just to put that language in the appropriations bill, and that language was put in the appropriations bill um, to make um, a lease from where it was at last year, very similar language, that about the only change that went with last year's uh, was that now instead of a 50 mile radius, you have to repurpose those within a 100 mile radius. So they actually broaden a little bit. So as you've been discussing this and, and talking about it, uh, the project is not eligible at this point in time to be repurposed, but these are the things that will make it eligible. And I'll go through these one by one. So to make the project eligible, you will need to submit documentation that justifies that Rochford Road project will no longer be progressing and you will not move it to the construction. As identified and Tom talked about in the EA that was approved and, and for that alternative and that preferred option. Second, you will need to inform the resource agencies as well as the public that it will not be built 
And those funds that are earmarked for this project will now be utilized and transferred to another transportation project or two. There you can do more than one. Third, you'll need to enter into an agreement with the DOT. Um, Tom talked about we had an agreement with you folks. We'll have to um, have another agreement that in essence states that the funds are going to be moved to, uh, to another project. You'll need to work with us to withdraw the projects. There's a lots of paperwork that we'll have to work out with Federal Highway to get this done. And then all of this needs to be done by July 5th. And because there's so much time, rel not so, there's not a lot of time, relative to all the paperwork that needs to be done. Uh, the deadline is September, but all of these steps have to be made and we have to inform Federal Highway of this, get this all paperwork done. So it seems like a very short time period and it is a short time because the, the appropriations bill was just done here very shortly ago. So that's where we're at. So to make this project eligible, these things have to be met and you have to um, complete these by that date. So with that, I have two options for you tonight to discuss. The first option, which I call option one, is to continue on the project just like you have been doing and, and utilizing these funds on this project. So I believe I was here a couple months ago and you were debating whether or not you wanted to go to a consultant to do the final design. That's really the next step. If you remember, you received correspondence to Federal Highway that says you at least have to engage in the right of way um, process by December 18th. That's still a requirement if you're moving forward with the project. If you don't meet that deadline, there's a couple ramifications. One, you could request Federal Highway to extend that date again, and you'd have to provide justification of why you did not meet that date. Or the other situation would be is that they terminate the project and the funds are no longer available for anything because this repurposing has that finite date on that and, and making that happen. My second bullet here is, is, is with Congress. And there is always the chance that when Congress looks at funds that they've allocated and provided for, for locals and state, that if it's sitting out there for quite some time, they have the ability to rescind those monies, which in essence is take those funds from you guys. And so normally when you're in danger of that, it's about two highway bills away. Well, Safety Lou was where this was at. We're now under Map 21, so the next highway bill could be a possibility that they may be looking at these old dollars and, and wanting to engage them in, in physically getting something done. The uh, next bullet is that the funds can only be used on this project, only on the related work, because it is very specific in the language that it's only for this project from the, the termini to the termini. With that, these funds are available and you have used them for the preliminary engineering. The environmental that Tom talked about, that you did receive a Fonzie by Federal Highway. And so the next step would be the final design, and then the right away appraisal and acquisition, and then finally the construction of the project. Um, my last bullet there is just to make you aware, and I'm sure you are, that anytime you are using federal funds, there are requirements that need to be met to be for those funds to be eligible and, and be reimbursed in you. So typically the way this happens is federal dollars are there. And as we are required to provide oversight for this project, it wasn't a check that you guys just received and did the project. Um, what happens is the state is required to provide oversight, and so we've been with you along this process. But if you move forward with this project, there's different milestones that, that you're going to meet. And we talked about the right of way that you have to meet that by December 18th. The next step would be to get the final design done and get construction done. From an obligation standpoint, you normally look at a, this one has three years. So once you decide you're gonna move forward, excuse me, I'm gonna back up. So we'll, we'll talk about that in the, in the next option. Can I just skip yes, that? Sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So, so the funding here, again, Tom's provided to this. I don't think we really wanna go through this in, in too much depth. Um, I've got the numbers in there that included the funding that was utilized on the bridge and since this, this was an earmark project, all of these eligible things that you spent these funds on would have to be um, repurposed if you, if you go that direction. So the bottom line there is $10,121,000 that was available for the project. The middle numbers there 
I really want to point out the difference between non-participating and participating. So non-participating is non-federal. So those funds were non-federal. The participating in the dollars that were spent using federal funds. So you've got 1.37 million that was on the design, and then the environmental was $166,000 for 1.537. I think Tom already provided that number to you on earlier slides. So the grand total of funds that's been expended is 1.622 million. As Tom discussed, the amount that's available for you on this project is a 10.121 minus those federal dollars that have been expended, which is 1.5 million, leaves 8.583 million for this project based on what the EA stated that was the preferred option or alternative. Option two is your other option. So in essence, option two would be that you will discontinue the project and you will repurpose those funds to another federal aid county route. Not all your routes are federal aid. There are certain ones, and normally it's the secondary roads that have enough traffic on those, and then they meet those standards. And then you would also have to uh, repay those funds back, those federal funds, as well as some of the state funds that were spent to date on this. So the general consideration here is we would need to amend our agreement with you. We would need a specific project or more that you would like to repurpose those funds on. I know you have some going on right now that have federal aid on them, and so these funds could be utilized in, in those as long as it's in that 100 mile radius. But again, when we do the paperwork, you're gonna have to identify which project you want to use on the, these funds to use on these. As I was stating earlier and, and kind of backed up here, those funds would have to be obligated within three years. And I'll talk about that just a little, little bit later. But once they're repurposed, you cannot repurpose those again. So this is a one-time shot once you repurpose on, onto those, that one or other projects that you're gonna move forward on. And then part of federal requirements is that you would also then have to do these quarterly reports and how the, how the projects are coming and the funds that are used and all that. So my last couple points here is that if you repurpose that 8.267 million that you received, you would need to pay back the federal and the state funds of 1.261 million. That would leave you $7,024,000, $25,000 to use somewhere else on another federal aid county location. I've got an alternative to you here, and this is something that um, I just bring up. I think we talked about it earlier on, a meeting or two ago. We have in the past, with last year repurposing and local governments that we worked with, we were able to exchange out some of those federal dollars for state funds. <clears throat> Very similar to what we do right now with your STP funds. If you remember a couple years ago, we kept the federal dollars and now gave you state funds. And those state funds can be used anywhere on a highway, bridge, or crushing gravel, as long as they're for highway and bridge purposes. I would say that we would not exchange the entire $7 million. You would need to identify how much you're looking at and then submit a request to our the South Dakota Depar our, our Transportation Commission. They are the board that are, is responsible for construction funds. And then they would take that up and then um, decide what percent of that, that they may be willing to exchange out. So, Madam Chair, that's all I have. Definitely here to answer questions that you may have. And Thank you, Mr. Jett. Questions, board? Okay. Madam Chair. <laughs> Mr. DeSantis. <clears throat> you talked about um, that if something changes in the federal highway program, that they could rescind the funds. If the project is underway, can they still rescind the funds? Yes. So any, Madam Chair, any, any unobligated funds that are left on the books that have not been spoken for. And when I say, let me just talk about obligation for, for a brief minute. 
So as I was talking earlier, what happens is, is you get a project and you move it through these milestones. And then you go to us and we in turn go to Federal Highway and say, we're at the point where we want to do preliminary design. The estimate to do that is X. So we say we want to obligate those funds. So let's say it was $2 million. So they will obligate $2 million. We get through that and then we say we want to buy right away and that's another million dollars. Then we go back to Federal Highway and say we want to obligate another million dollars. And then we finally get to the point where we want to do construction. And so you have to have the final design done, right away acquired, any utilities, at least the agreements, complete on those and certify all that stuff, bring those to us, and, and then we in turn ask Federal Highway to obligate the funds. So until all the funds are obligated, any amount that's on the books is subject to a rescission by Congress. And that's the way they write that typically, and Kasai will probably tell you a little more about it, but on anything that's unobligated. And that is regardless of whether or not it's South Rochford Road or some other project we decide to it's undertake. A, it's a, a sentence or two in their, their bill, and there's no project specific. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Joel. Can, can I... Just yes, one quick one on that, because I think the process, to understand the process from once it's obligated and how bills are paid. <laughs> so let's say you get to the point where you're going to let the project, and, and we get it obligated. Again, that's not an open checkbook. We just don't send you money. What happens is you let the project, a contractor will begin work, and as that person or that company starts to submit bills and has bills, they will send them to us. We'll provide the oversight, and then we ask Federal Highway to reimburse us. So we're kind of bankroll on this thing, but it's a very short time period. But again, then they pay us back for what you've expended through that contract. Very good. Commissioner Lucre. Joe. <clears throat> Can you can you clarify some of those deadline dates again for me? You said July 5th. So July 5th was when we need your decision that you're wanting to repurpose. And if you're going to do that, hopefully that you're also starting to get these things in place relative to notifying the, the resource agencies and the public and, and the things that I identified in, in the first part of the presentation. And that's really the key date right now for you. Okay. Any other dates, Commissioner, that... September. You were looking for that was for us in Federal Highway. That's the drop dead date for Federal Highway, and so that July fifth date is the key to get all that paperwork done. That's just how long it takes to get all of this stuff completed and submitted in to them, which seems like a lot of time, but okay. that's just the way it is. Your follow up, Mr. Lucre? No, Mr. Fairby. I'd like to follow up on what uh, Commissioner DeSanto was asking about. <laughs> If we're, if we've bid the project, then you're saying that there's a possibility that that all the money wouldn't come to us. No, once the progress payments understand that, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Once we get to the letting point, we're done. We will obligate all of the funds. Okay. Yep. That's yep. okay. If you decide that you want to repurpose these funds and put them on another project. Then you have three years to obligate those funds. Yes. But if I could follow up, once, yes, once the bid is let on, no matter what we do, once the bid's let, then the funds are ours. The funds are obligated. And as that contractor has bills and requests payments, we will pay you based on that, that <laughs> estimate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Lucroy. I just want clarification, Joel. If it was to go to repurpose, number one, you got to have a project, right? Mm -hmm. Number, well, that's number one. Number two, we'd have to repay $1.261 million. That's, that's correct. Right off the bat to do that. That's correct. And, and so you got to have a project, repay it back, plus, and have this all planned out by July 5th. July 5th. Yeah, and I'll maybe go out on a limb here a little bit relative to paying us back. I, I think there's something, you know, we provide you guys STP funds right now. I'm not sure that we need a physical check and we could probably work with you relative to what monies we would provide you on the STP as opposed to reimburse or providing those to you and just holding those back. But that is one of the requirements of those payments. Those dollars have to be paid back, that 1.261. Okay. That's what I want to know. Madam Chair. Yes, sir, Mr. DeSanto. If we uh, repurpose the funds. Does that <coughs> include 
that we would have to withdraw from re replacing the bridge? No, the bridge is still eligible under bridge replacement yeah. funding. The reason why I put those numbers in there is because though this project specific monies have been used on that bridge, but it is eligible for, for bridge replacement funds and, and those can be utilized. Okay, I, I thought that, I just wanted to specify that for the public. Thank you. Mr. Commissioner Fairby. Um, the bullet you had up there about uh, satisfying federal requirements and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> Does that mean the road has to be done to the, to the EA specs? The road oh. needs to be done based on that alternative that was in the EA, which is the, in essence, what Tom talked about, what the project will detail. Well, let me ask it this way, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I've, I've heard the suggestion made that when the money runs out, wherever we are on the road, uh, we can quit. Is that true or not true? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I missed that. <clears throat> if we, we start down the, Start the project, and and uh, we're nine tenths of the way down the, to Rochford, or or vice versa. The money runs out. I've heard it bandied around that we could we could quit at that point. Commissioner Judd, or Commissioner Judd, <laughs> Mr. Judd. So that's your really your final design, and seeing what you get for for your bid at the time that you go to that direction, unless there is a significant change construction change order you, you find something out there that's really not anticipated you should know that before you even go to bids as far as what it's going to cost you right. the earmark funds that are available that is it so if your project comes in above and beyond that as tom pointed out that will be on your cost any ex any expenditure over that so if i can follow up that <clears throat> so once we take that fork in the road whichever fork we take we're committed. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I have, on the repurpose of funds, I don't know if you guys read this too, and I don't know if the public has this information. The project and repurpose earmark funds to another federal aid county project within a 100-mile radius of the original earmark location. So when we, if we decide to repurpose, it's in within that 100-mile radius for number one. And number two, what was I going to say for the second? And I forgot. Um, just so jo Joel, those four steps basically for repurpose have to be done by July fifth for the option two. I think the the major thing is is that you make a decision by that date, and these other things happen very shortly thereof. Okay. For Federal Highway to fill comfortable that you're you're going to meet these requirements okay thank you sir madam chair mr desanto just to clarify joel <clears throat> the deadline of deadlines is july is september 18th in other words if we don't have a new project disclosed or then then we're in trouble by september 18th I think you're cutting it. September thirtieth is <laughs> September thirtieth is the end of the federal fiscal year, and that's okay. why that date is important. Okay. But I throw out the July fifth date, and we can wiggle a little bit either way. Right. But with all of these requirements to get this paperwork done, we don't have a lot of time to spare one way or another from that. Gotcha. Thank you, Commissioner. If I might, I've got one more question about. <clears throat> can you? Explain to us for sure what qualifies as federal aid road. You, and I'm, I'm assuming Mr. the chair probably, <laughs> probably signs off on this, but you have a federal aid route that is approved. And so you have a map, and I can send that to you again, but you have a map that identifies where all your federal aid routes are and which ones are eligible to use federal aid on it and which are, ones are not. And those are typically county secondary roads. Yeah, thank you. Thank Madam you. Chair. Commissioner DeSanto. Does that include the Sheridan Lake Road project? 
That, that is federal aid route. You you have your f federal funds that you have spent on that, and, and you have federal funds that you're planning on to spend on that. So that correct. Yes. Okay. And one other question on re on the alternative under option two. Um, can that, if we choose to do that, where we swap out money with the state, would we be able to use that money on any bridge project? You can use that on any highway or bridge, whether it's Rochford Road or anywhere else you have in, within the county, as long as it's a highway or a bridge and, and meets the purpose of how we receive the funds. So very similar, it's, it's state funds, it's gas tax and it's excise tax and it's earmark, not earmark, but it's purpose for that. So very good. any Thank of you. those. Thank you. Sir, Mr. Jen, if it, here's the bottom line. If we decide that we're gonna repurpose and we wanna put this money in and we get all these the requirements done by July 5th, you guys look at this and you say, do you have to give us the seven million? Can, do, we, do you have to let us, can you say this is their money, um, that they get to spend it or do you put it in the pot and then you pick out of the repurposing funds for different people, meaning okay, so we have 20 million now for repurposing. Are we guaranteed that seven million back to the county just because we applied to repurpose? Correct. These okay. are these are funds that you went after with the congressional folks, and they were put in the bill for this specific project. And what we're doing is is saying, here's an, in essence, here's an option. Okay. And if you want to do that, there are seven million dollars for you to go do to do somewhere else. So we'd pay back the one point two six, and then we'd repurpose for seven million to try to do different projects. Do different projects. Okay. And, Madam Chair, I guess I do have one more question. If I, Fair, Fairby. You mentioned the Transportation Commission would have to... Uh, George, pull your mic down, please, hmm. sir. If, if we uh, decided to ask for repurpose, the Transportation Commission would have to, to okay our, our request? No, the Commission doesn't have to approve your request. That's between the Department and yourselves. But if you want to exchange out some of the, the, those $7 million of federal funds for state funds, then the Commission does have to sign off on that and then identify, you're going to have to identify how much of that you want, and then they would have to agree to that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, Board? Thank you, Mr. Gent. Thank you for your time tonight, sir. Next, we have Congressional Delegation, Mr. Kasai. Thank you for coming, Mr. Kasai. Thank you, Madam Chair, gentlemen. Uh, it's very difficult not to be redundant after Tom and Joel, because <laughs> uh, the circumstances have changed uh, quite a bit since, uh, since I was requested to come and speak. So I've been with Senator Thune. I've been his West River Director for the last 12 and a half years, which coincides with about the same time that uh, that uh, then commissioners from the county were making the case for this project. Uh, so uh, uh, we, we passed it literally about five months after uh, I started working for Senator Thune, after he was re uh, elected. And then, of course, we worked closely with Senator Tim Johnson and Representative uh, Herseth at the, at the time. And, and I have to just explain for, for folks that do not uh, understand what earmarks are, and it's... Uh, uh, it's when a member of Congress or several members of Congress can come in and say, I want so much money to go specifically to a certain project. So this is effectively bypassing the agency that would right now have control over where the money should go based on priorities. So at the time, uh, we had that flexibility. Since 2011, that's no longer. So since 2011, earmarks are history, and there's not an appetite in Congress to, uh, you know, to bring him back. So members of Congress cannot direct money to specific projects. Uh, you know, in, in transportation, different departments of transportation across the country have that, uh, that ability to decide based on priorities. Now, when I was asked uh, several weeks ago to uh, come to, uh, to your meeting, meeting it was the, answer, I mean, the question was simple. It was, is this project eligible for repurposing? You know, and this is after we passed the omnibus. Uh, and I, I think Joel made that very clear, that the answer is yes, providing that uh, the county meets several actions that have to be done in a relatively short period of time. So uh, that makes this an option because you had some conflicting you know, information last time, whether you can or cannot, uh, cannot do. So, uh, so 
in in a nutshell, when, when you cut through the you know the requirements, it's the county that has the burden to make the case to the state DOT and to the public why you're you're deviating from the original intent of the earmark that Congress put in place. So that's really what it uh, boils down to. So the the clock is ticking and and it's really decision time. Uh, and I want to I want to give you a reason why I'm saying this. Uh, I, I can say this freely that if you decide, and I'm not trying to persuade you one way or another, that okay, we, we're we're going to do something else, and uh, we'll revisit this five, ten years from now. Uh, there is not another funding mechanism such as earmarks, so it's not going to happen. It's very, very unlikely, or next to virtually impossible. Uh, in this budgetary environment, the rescission or looking at the money that's out there. And by the way, the money that's out there is not a couple of million dollars, it's three and a half billion to $13 billion. So there's ten, tens of thousands of projects across the nation that are in the same situation. So when Joel was talking about uh, the need to have the information in early in July, it's because you have federal highways working with tens of thousands of projects that they have to, uh, to process the paperwork. So it's not, it's not a dozen or a couple of dozens of, uh, of uh, projects. So the, the risk of, of somebody in Congress or the administration looking at these billions of dollars and saying, okay, th these folks are on the fence, they're not doing anything with this, rather than borrow more money to uh, take care of uh, you know, infrastructure, well, we should probably just resend this money and get it back. And it will be very difficult for a member of Congress to say no to that, because it makes sense on the surface. So that's really making the case why you really, it, it is decision, decision time. Another thing that Joel might have uh, pointed out, if you repurpose, you have one shot at it. You cannot repurpose again. So it's, uh, you cannot change your mind if you repurpose and decide we're gonna spend it on project ABC, you have one shot at it. Is that correct, Joel? Yeah, so you have, you, know, you have to make sure that that's what, uh, what you wanna do. So it boils down to the following, and I'll open it for questions if you have any. So now it's, uh, it's your call. It's either to move forward, uh, repurpose it, and meet the, you know, the, the time uh, line that's relatively short timeline, or negotiate some kind of agreement with the state for, uh, you know, to exchange some of the federal money for state money for a portion of it. Yeah, and we'll, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, the question that, that came up before about uh, the unobligated money that if you're in the middle of a project and you have uh, a situation where you're halfway through and yet you haven't let a bid out, uh, we will give you a heads up. So we will keep a close eye in Congress on what the discussions happening at the committee level on if, if, you know, if there's a momentum for rescission and we will give you plenty of time, plenty of, uh, of advance notice so that you can get things you know, taken care of. Thank you, Mr. Any Kasai. questions? You're welcome. <coughs> Any questions for Mr. Kasai? <coughs> Commissioner LaCroix. Thank you, Kasai, for coming here and clarifying some of what happened because I was a little disturbed at, at our last speech with some of our communications with which came forward and, and there was a lot of there was some misunderstanding. So I appreciate you coming here and, and clearing this up and and that means a lot to me right now. Because I was I was pretty upset that last meeting. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, any board? I do. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Commissioner DeSanto. <laughs> sorry. I didn't know Madam if you were Chair. just going, okay, move forward or? Kasai, you spoke about earmarks no longer existing and highway funds being quite limited. Mm -hmm. That means they're limited for any project we want to do, Correct. right? Not just South Rochford Road, but Anything we want to do in the future to take care of something that's a necessity in the county, correct. It's going to be tough to get the money. Correct. Thank well, you. Well, I mean, just also to point out the, the difficulty, uh, you're competing with, with the rest of the country. Sure. You're competing with pretty high traffic counts. Uh, in 2005, even completing the Heartland Express did not qualify on its own to move forward. We had to resort to earmarks. Even the Heartland Express. Very good. Thank you, and thank you for Thanks coming. The same. You bet. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions, board? Okay. Next, we have Pace Law, Mr. Mark Van Norman. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the commission. 
I have Vice President Darla Black from the Oglala Sioux Tribe with us, and we wanted to thank you for the cooperative working relationship we had and moving forward to take Peshaw and trust. And Vice President Black was just going to say a few words about the importance of our sacred site to us. Thank you for both coming today as well. So thank we you, Madam it. Chair. <clears throat> Good evening, Commissioners. I want to tell you a little, little quick short story. Years ago, there was a young girl that was removed from the reservation and placed in a boarding school. When she came home, she had three children. The three children and the lady became involved in alcohol. They didn't understand their culture. They didn't know their language. They didn't understand anything about spirituality. And eventually, the children died of alcoholism. And today, we have a resurgence. The elders that knew of the sacred sites, that knew of the sacred ways, are teaching our young adults now. And the resurgence that we have today are, are young adults that are not using alcohol, that are not using drugs, that are not turning to gangs because of our spirituality. Now, when Pesla came about, it was something that was really powerful to us because this is the time of the year my people follow the stars and the moon and the sun. And right now, the access are on all our sacred sites, all seven up here. So the ceremonies are beginning. And the younger generation that are coming up are in the ceremonies. They're practicing our sweat lodge. They're practicing our sun dances. And now the schools are busing our kids up here to all the sacred sites. And our elders are coming here also to visit those sacred sites. So in our Lakota way of belief, we always knew, number one, that our language was important. We always knew that our spirituality is critical to us. We always knew that where we came from, there was no alcohol and drugs. That's not our way of life. And there's a resurgence of that. And I thank the commissioners and everybody involved. And the other matter of what we believe as Lakota people is the symbolic red, yellow, black, and white. And we use the color symbolically because the red, the yellow, the black, and white are the color of the two-legged on this earth. So when we circle them up, we believe that they can come together in peace and harmony. And that's what's happening today. I thank the community of Rapid City that are also reaching out to our young adults here. They're changing our people. I went up to do a tour with Box Elder Job Corps, and we have a lot of Native people there that are making that change, walking away from alcohol and drugs and looking for an education, looking for a different way of life. And so I come here in representation of my people. My name is Darla Black. I, I grew up with the language. I grew up with the spirituality. I'm alcohol and drug free. And I'm very interested in our youth. And I'm interested in our elders. And so Pesla is critical to us. It's a sacred place where we come here to pray. And it's changing our people. And I had to share that with you so you can have an understanding of why it's critical to us. And in the Lakota way, our language, our spirituality, our way of life, our belief system, our people are not prejudiced. Our people respect you because you're in that circle. We believe that and we live by that. And so in the beautiful Lakota language, le khtatuki ho ampetu washte chichap. Na takuki le na makoche tranta, na mini tranta, hena wakam. Chahe uncha, unkie, uni. What I said in my beautiful Lakota language is that because of the land, because of the water, and because of us as a sacred people, 
this is how we live. This is how we will continue to survive and live. So there's a change out there, and I wanted to share that. Mr. Van Norman. Thank you, Mr. So, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Vice President Blake. <coughs> so we, we wanted to thank you for, for our good cooperative work and relationship, and, and that extends to the road. And we, we thought about this a lot as we were going through this process, and we had a request from the county to do the cooperative agreement on the right-of-way, and it recognizes that you have the right-of-way on the road, that uh, you have the primary responsibility for construction and maintenance up there, and that uh, the road is going to remain open. And if for any reason we were doing a ceremony up there that we would like to close the road, that we'd come forward and use your permit process okay. uh, to do that. We don't have any plans to do that. Uh, we said that we plan to, to use the land as a sacred site, and we are, and we are uh, putting up our buffalo fence to, to uh, think about reintroducing our buffalo. Um, we, we did participate in the EA process, and we did say that we believe the less intrusive approach, approach of simply upgrading the road through, along the existing right-of-way is the preferred approach over straightening, widening, and fully paving the road, which really maybe would have moved the road about a quarter mile west and would have been uh, uh, much different than the current plan. So uh, we didn't object uh, to the current plan, we did suggest that maybe you want to put up uh, signs that say Buffalo <laughs> at the entrance <laughs> to our property. Um, but uh, as part of the trust land process, and I, I talked to uh, your counsel, Jay Alderman, um, about this during the process, the, the land goes into trust, but your existing right of way, you know, remains in place and it goes into trust along with uh, the existing right of way, so your your right of way is uh, respected in that process, and and we respect that, and we appreciate uh, the chance to work with y'all. So thank you very much, and appreciate the chance to be here today. And if you have any questions, I appreciate we're happy that. to answer. Um, board, do we have any questions for Miss Darla or Mr. Van Norman? I'd just like to thank you for the letter that you wrote. I think that you pointed out several very um, important issues in that letter. And, uh, and I thank you for coming as well. I appreciate the highway department and, and the um, group that helped Mr. Van Norman and his group to make sure that the land stayed the way it was going to and the road was going to uh, be, in, um, be okay with what they were doing out there. And they changed a few things to kind of put it together as a solution between both sides, and I appreciated that, um, and we found a common ground. So um, I thought that was pretty awesome. Yeah, So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we have public testimony, and Ms. Holly will call your name, and then um, she will set the timer. And can you tell me how the timer works, Ms. Holly, again? I can. Um, for public notice, the when you approach the podium, we just ask that you identify yourself for the record. In front of Chairman Hadcock, you'll see a little black box that has three lights on it. The green light will signal the start of your time. You will have three minutes. Yes, ma'am. To speak. Um, the yellow light will flash when you have 30 seconds remaining, so we just ask that you wrap up your comments. Box. And when the light turns red, that means you need to wrap it up. Um, I will, the board has asked me to call names randomly from both sides. I will do my best to balance. Um, from looking at it, we do have more people in support than opposed, so I'll try and make sure we go side to side. There are signatures that I apologize, I absolutely cannot read. <laughs> so I will leave those to the end. I want to make sure we get everybody. Um, so we'll go ahead and start. If, if I call your name and you decide you don't want to speak, that's certainly acceptable. Just let me know. Is there? Yes, sir. Uh, Holly, how would we be able to either forfeit time or transfer time to somebody else? Well, here's what happens. If Joel Junt comes up, meaning he's the public, and um, 
three people say, you know, Joel's going to speak for us, then um, we give him more time to speak. So you three will, you'll tell Holly your name at the beginning when Joel starts, and then Holly will cross your names off, off the list because then you forfeited your time to Joel. Does that make sense to the public? Okay. You got okay. that, Ms. Holly? Um, we'll start with Mr. Bill Griffin. Either one? Yes, sir. Hey. Hi, I'm Bill Griffin. I'm actually supporting the road, and I'm speaking for my mom, Barbara Griffin. Um, my mom was born and raised in Rochford. Uh, her parents ran the post office there. Her grandparents lived there, uh, and she's still very involved in the Rochford community. Uh, we live in, in Custer now, and uh, we went up in May, and uh, as you can imagine, she's quite elderly. <laughs> And um, she uh, basically expressed that traveling over the road, even my car has good shocks, but it was still quite an ordeal for her. And uh, she's finding it very difficult to be, uh, remain involved in Rochford because of the condition of the road. Anyway. Okay. Thank All you, right. Mr. Griffin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, next will be Jace DeCorey. Mr. DeCorey? Miss? Sorry. How are you, ma'am? Where do I talk? Here? Yes, ma'am. You can pull that mic towards you if you'd like. I am kind of short. That's okay. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jace DeCorey, and I, I live in Spearfish. I'm a member of, of the Ochati, Ocheti Shakoi, the seven council fires of the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota people. I refer to myself as being Lakota. And I'm in opposition to the paved road or the development, increased development in the Peshla area. Um, I understand and I appreciate the elder uh, talking about accessibility. And um, gravel roads sometimes are a little bit inaccessible, but they are a road and you can ride on it. And it's, it's, I think it's important that we do have access to this sacred site. So I, I'm glad that the two representatives talked about uh, being cooperative and having access to our sacred site. Uh, we are, I am concerned, and I speak for my family and other um, relatives of mine, my Tioshpai, that we are concerned that this area be kept as pristine as possible. Um, we are concerned about other organizations or groups, developers that might make, uh, see this as a sign to start de making increased development in the area. Um, as a tribal person, I am concerned that it, I do not want it to be further developed. Um, it is one of our most sacred sites in the Black Hills. It is the center of our Lakota universe uh, in, in Hesapa and the Black Hills. It is our sacred buffalo altar. It is where we hold our ceremonies, our spring ceremonies, to honor and pray for all things, all living things, uh, human, two-legged, but also the animals and all that live on the earth, all life forms. And in our ceremony, we pray for deceased relatives, our human relatives who have passed on in the year. So that is a mourning, a very serious mourning ceremony for us. We also pray for all our relatives, our two-leggeds and the winged and those that we took so that we may live, may survive, may eat. And so um, we pray for all those lives that we took as well. We pray for the water, mini, mini wichoni, water is life. Um, even though Deerfield Lake is now a man-made <coughs> lake and it's a new water area in that location, that is a very special place now. It's a new place for the people to honor the relative, uh, our relative, the water. Um, I, I hope that the commissioners here will be culturally sensitive to the wishes of our people, the Lakota people and uh, the early inhabitants historically in our spiritual connection to this area. And one of the things that I was concerned and I was kind of hoping that someone would ask about, is there an opportunity or perhaps you may make, I, I guess I'm giving a suggestion that we perhaps may, can make the bridge because I can see that the bridge needs to be repaired and then maybe repurpose the other remaining um, amount of money to other 
projects that you might need in Pennington County, because I'm assuredly, um, you would probably need some of the things that are done in other places as well. And I don't know where the thing is to see where I'm out of time. So <laughs> right here. I'm probably, right. oh, there it is. Right <laughs> so I thank you for listening to me. And and let me a win to kahe, let me a imachi api jaysti kori. Thank you for listening to me. Mitaku ye yasi. We are all related. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Corey. Sully. Uh, next will be Sharon Frome. Sharon. Good evening. I am Sharon Fromey, and I wonder, may I ask a question of a commissioner? Um, if we can ask that commissioner, if that's okay, who would you like to ask? Commissioner Farabee. And she asked you a question, Mr. Farabee. Certainly. Why are you against the road being done? Would you like to answer that question, sir? I have not said that I'm going to vote in one way or another. What I have said is I'm very, very concerned about Icebox Canyon and very, very concerned about Pace Law. Well, what you call Icebox Canyon, we have always called the S-curves. And for a good many years, I was a member of the Rochford Fire Department and the Rescue Squad. And in the wintertime, we have pulled so many people out of the ditches. We've had so many accidents, at least four or five every year. And someday somebody's going to get killed. And then unless that road is changed and improved, it will happen. Thank you. Thank you. No, Thank I, you. if I could, that's a good point to, to bring up. Where's the highway superintendent? Mr. Fairby, I'm going to let people, the public, okay. speak, and but, then but afterwards. But this, this is a good point to, to address the design of the road at that point. Right. And, and if you write that down, George, that would be good. But I'm going to keep letting the public speak. Okay, next one. <coughs> Juanita Road, Rod. Miss Juanita. <laughs> we'll get one side or the other, right? <laughs> Good evening, uh, madam and gentlemen. Um, and where is my little... Is right here, ma'am. green thing? Yes. Okay. <laughs> this black thing with <laughs> colors, green so, thing on there. <laughs> okay. So I'm Juanita Rod, and she got it very well. And um, first of all, I'd like to tell you our family lived just off Rochford Road for several years, and uh, we weren't ever concerned about uh, the gravel or the dust. Um, we lived on what's called Seven Hills Road, which uh, we were just off a few feet, actually. So, um, And then we moved back into town because the kids got older and eh, they wanted to be closer to town. So, um, But I'm going to speak as the only white guy in my family. I'm in a family. Um, my family uh, is, my husband's a native person who is an archeologist and he has, I can't speak for his expertise, um, but he has now been able to go up and finally do the assessment of that land uh, that was never open to the, to the nation before. Um, and you know, it was private land. So, uh, quote, private land. And so now we know that it is, um, it's like um, Ms. DeCorey mentioned, it's a church. Um, and to further disturb it, I think would be, just in my way of feeling, would be uh, just not a good thing to do. So um, I, I wanted to add that because um, I cannot speak as a tribal member, as some of our tribal members have, but I can speak as someone who's lived off that road, almost right on the road, and I can also speak as someone who's been um, very, I guess, blessed to be part of witnessing what we now um, know is on that land, and um, it's very sacred. I, I wouldn't want it further disturbed. 
Um, and I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to get pretty emotional, but I would not want it further disturbed. I agree with um, Ms. Ms. Fromey that it, it needs to be some of that area improved. Uh, cell phone reception is not there. Um, Icebox Canyon is, I mean, I can tell you it's bad. Paving it would not be, would not be the thing to do. So I see I'm out of time. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Ms. Juanita. Uh, Dr. Paul Wittenberg, please. I'm Paul Wittenberg, uh, Seven Hills Road. And I guess I'm concerned, as a veterinarian who I am, is the dust, and we have so many horses, and the Indians have the buffalo there, Native Americans, that the dust is not good for them. We have respiratory problems among the calves and things like that. People with cattle on open range. We have a horse, but a lot of other people's horses. Horses are very, very susceptible to dust. And I think for public health, we should keep down the dust. People that have respiratory problems, that's a disaster there. I know we want to keep it wild. I agree with you. But <laughs> public health is very important. And I think we should really look at that part. And then also the danger on the road, the dust. We have so many four-wheelers come by, and I'm coming out of my driveway. I cannot see a vehicle. And it's not my eyes, it's the dust. It's like fog. And I've had twice a real close to one of the wrecks from one of the semis coming by. I did not see it after he went by. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Guys. Okay. Not supposed to um, clap, but that was <laughs> that way. I appreciate it. Next is Elizabeth Cook Lynn. Miss Elizabeth. Deb, can you straighten that? So you can, you can, you have to see it. Sorry. Can you see that? <laughs> can they you. see it? Can you guys still see that from the podium? Okay. Hello. Hello. Where is the timer? Right here, ma'am. Right there. Oh, <laughs> um, my name is Elizabeth Cook Lynn, and I'm a member of the Crow Creek Sioux Tribe. Kudui cha cha. I wish that I knew you. Um, I don't know many people here, but I've lived in Rapid City a very long time. But I was born and raised at Fort Thompson. Um, I want to talk about briefly about the fact that we do have a shared history white people, and Indians. And I would like to think that uh, this board <coughs> will do the right thing about this matter. I am opposed, of course, to any further kind of uh, development uh, that might go on there. I think that uh, we should try to respect each other and uh, make an attempt to negotiate things appropriately. When you look at the treaties that we've signed, one of them says, one of the points in the treaty says, after they establish the boundaries of the reservation, uh, which of course has been violated over and over, um, one of the things it said was, white men cannot come here without our permission. That establishes the uh, business of uh, negotiation, I suppose. And it establishes um, uh, consent. I don't know any tribe that is in, in, in uh, saying that uh, further development of this place should occur. One of the things that we can expect after um, roads are made, and that's what the Forest Service does so well, is uh, further access. And it will create further development. And uh, so there are things that we need to think about in terms of the next, what, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. And I hope that the board can see its way. It's not about me. 
It's not about you. It's not about your horses. It's not even about the buffalo. It's about whether or not we can respect each other and respect our uh, needs. Thank you very much. Bidamaye. Thank you, Ms. Cook. Ms. Holly. Ms. Colleen Langley, please. Hi, I'm Colleen Langley. Uh, I operate the general store in Rochford and have for 19 years. Um, I think the number one issue in the, with the road right off the top is the safety issue. That alone in my book pretty much warrants the, the paving of the road, repair of the road. But beyond that, every summer I have thousands of people come through the store. During the rally, the motorcycle rally, whether it's a car classic, rally, the Corvette rally, whatever. The number one topic of conversation is when is the road going to be paved? That is a spectacular ride across there. Everyone should be able to enjoy it. The road as it is now restricts that. And I think we all have a right to experience it and, and to be able to take a ride across there no matter what kind of vehicle we're in. And as far as I'm concerned, this road needs to be built. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Colleen. Uh, Kevin McNitt, please. Hello, I'm Kevin McNitt. I live on the uh, Deerfield Road, um, just by the lake. Um, my primary concern, um, the first and foremost, is the increase in taxes, both due to maintenance uh, of the road, increased maintenance in the wintertime, putting salt and sand down on that road. Um, I drove that road uh, for quite a few years, two to three times a week, all winter long. I've got a car, front-wheel drive car. Never once had a problem getting down that road in the winter, uh, winter time. Um, I think the gravel actually makes it a little bit safer, especially as you get down into the canyon. That is going to be icy all the time with pavement, uh, and is just going to cause problems. Um, it, you know, I, I think not only the maintenance on the road, but there may be an increase in property values. Um, I don't think the county needs an excuse to raise property values anymore to increase the taxes. Um, so I'm, I'm very concerned about that. Uh, the other issue um, is just an increase in traffic uh, on both the Deerfield Road and uh, the Rochford Road. Um, you know, there's a lot of deer, there's elk out on the road, um, you know, especially with motorcycles. Um, you know, that road's not made for increased traffic. You've already said you're going to have the road narrow. Um, it's just not made for it. Um, you're going to have collisions with motorcycles, uh, with the deer and the elk. Um, you're, you, you're probably going to have deaths associated with that. I don't know, if, you know, there really hasn't been a lot of accidents down, you know, Icebox Canyon uh, that have resulted in injuries or fatalities, but if you increase the motorcycle traffic on that road, you're going to have that. Um, and my last point is just that uh, you've already got Highway 385 that attaches Hill City to the Lead and Deadwood area, so I don't think we need another road uh, going through there that connects that. If people want to get from Lead and Deadwood to Hill City, they've got Highway 385. Uh, it's a wider road. It's a little bit safer. It's a little bit straighter. Um, I don't think there's going to be any issues uh, there. So that's all I had to say. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Paul Zweifel, please. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> I traveled here from Sioux Falls, actually, to support the project. I own 240 acres out off the Rochford Road and uh, in a home there. We spend probably 40% of our time here. Um, I'm in favor of the road. I think a lot of the public is, too. They've had 11 years of anticipation. Um, I think it should be done with asphalt. I think it'll help with the wintertime travel and melting some of the snow melt or some of the snowpack. Um, including the health and safety and frost heaves. Um, of course, there'll be an economic impact to the, to the county as well. Um, emergency response times, I think, will go up. And uh, I just think repurposing the funds would be a mistake. And 
yeah, it's a it's a great area, and I I think the road would just improve it. So, thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kenneth Jasper, please. Good evening. I'm Kenneth Jasper. I'm an attorney here in town. I've been practicing in the area of Indian law since 1978. I've had cases before the U.S. Supreme Court, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the State Supreme Court. <clears throat> the problem arose when this property was placed in the trust. Back then, you had an agreement with the landowner, basically, that allowed this road to go through. Now, as I understand, you have somewhat of an agreement with the tribes, and I don't think that agreement is worth the paper it's written on. You do not have an agreement with the United States government because the tribes have this property in trust. The tribes are wards of the United States government. And at any time, this road could be shut down and at that point, anybody coming from Rochford is going to have to stop at the border. And anybody coming from Deerfield is going to have to stop at the border. And if the tribes say, we don't want traffic through here anymore, the traffic stops. Now, everybody would like to have a paved road right up to their garage or to their property. People here in Rapid City would like to have all their alleys paved as well, but that's not going to happen. If you want to pave this road, you can do it, but I would say don't pave it through Peace Law. You don't have the authority to do that. You don't really have the authority to grade it, to plow the snow, etc., in the winter time either. I mean. The prior commission made an agreement, but as I say, that property or that agreement isn't worth the paper it's written on, in my opinion. And I think you ought to have your county attorneys really look at that. Because as I said, I don't think it's worth the paper it's written on when you really get right down to it. You know, we have a constitution that says the government has the right to make treaties with Indian tribes. States do not have that authority. Even the state of South Dakota can't make an agreement with an Indian tribe to grant the right to make roads through trust property. Federal government can. Even I, as an attorney, when I was representing Indian tribes, I had to have my contract approved by the Secretary of the Interior. Otherwise, I couldn't legally represent the tribe. I could individual Indians, and I did that for several years. I represented Time. Indian tribes. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, is there a Mark Olson? Hi, I'm Mark Olson. Uh, my wife is a third generation resident of on the South Rochester Road, just moved here from Butte County. And uh, I'd like to see the road go forward. I think uh, looking at these timelines, I don't think you can get the reappropriation done. And uh, it's a gamble I wouldn't take. So, all I got to say. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Uh, Rald Eidness. Sir. Uh, my name's Rald Eidness, and uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to voice my opinion. Uh, my wife and I have been silent up to this point because I really thought this was the best opportunity uh, to hear both sides of this <laughs> argument. Uh, plus, hear from the first four uh, representatives that. Uh, gave us a lot of insight. Four years ago, my wife and I purchased a home on Bangor Loop just outside of Rochford. It's right at the junction of South Rochford Road and Rochford Road. I look right down on that bridge that's going to be moved a little closer to our picture window. Um, 
We've attended meetings, uh, reviewed extensive history of this project, uh, been very involved for the four years, reading the newspaper articles, listening to the uh, reports from the commission and the highway department. Um, we've uh, talked to and visited with not only our neighbors, but a lot of visitors that have passed through the area. And I think uh, that it's, this is the right time to approve this project, particularly looking at, at uh, uh, the resources, uh, the money that would have to be given back. Uh, now's the time to do this. Here's the problem, and I'm speaking probably for my wife and I, but also from what I'm hearing through newspaper articles, uh, through uh, uh, TV, radio, and, and other sources, uh, and then we come up with this uh, repurposing, we somehow feel like we're out in right field in this, uh, this whole thing, where, where the, these funds are here and now you're thinking of putting it to what probably you're considering a more important project. Um, I think uh, I, I, I was particularly disturbed at a couple comments that were made in the paper about uh, rather give the money back to the government uh, than fix this road for 33 cars uh, a day. That, that's not correct. I'm standing, we stand there and I, I can count that many cars in, in several hours, but that's really not, not the point. I think the point is, is that this, this was a, uh, a project that has been approved, studied, and, and we should move forward on it. One quick thing though, it's not a zero sum situation. If you don't approve this project, I, you need to address mag water issues, straightening uh, uh, ice canyon, a box canyon, uh, maybe putting up some uh, rails. Uh, we need to, put, whether, it's, whether it's graveled or pavement, we need to put some sand on it in winter time and make it a safer road. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Wayne Ortman. Thank you. I'm Wayne Ortman. We uh, live on the Rochford Deerfield corner on the bridge there. Uh, my wife has sent different letters. I've talked to George on the phone one time. But our biggest concern is somebody's going to get killed on that S curve or icebox curve. We've seen more traffic every year, ever since the flood, where it took out Mickelson Trail and grates on the road and the road. At that time, Heine Junkie called us and said, portion of the road is down on your yard. You better get out here. But we have pulled out more cars since that flood. The road slopes out instead of up. There's been cars there that were, two wheels were off. It was trees that were holding them, and there were kids still in the car when we went up to pull them. It was so bad, we actually, two of us pulled. One hooked a chain on the front, and one in the back pulled it sideways with it. And that's, we know the project needs to be done for the safety on that curve, whether it's the whole project or that curve, but it's somebody's going to get killed there. We've seen some terrible. Just this spring, there was a FedEx truck that was, I don't know how, Dean ever pulled that one out on that ice, but it was tilted so far, and he thought it was going to land on him, the driver, to you know it. So um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Urban. Excellent. Uh, Raleigh Nome, please. Good evening. Uh, my name's Raleigh Noem. I'm from Hill City. I have uh, lived and worked in the Black Hills area for since 1978, so essentially 40 years. And as a lifelong South Dakotan, uh, who's fortunate, have been fortunate enough to spend most of my life here in the Black Hills area, and as a resident of Pennington County, I'm here to voice my support 
for for the project. Um, <clears throat> The, uh, I'm very familiar with the road, uh, this stretch of road, as I am many of the uh, uh, roads in that area and throughout the Black Hills uh, from, uh, from my different uh, capacities of, of my career over those 40 years or so. And um, I believe that completing this project uh, will be an enhancement for the area, the region, and the state of South Dakota. And I think it's important to look at it from the state of South Dakota standpoint, too, because uh, uh, you know, tourism is uh, one of our top two industries in the state. And uh, being able to do something to enhance uh, this, our area, uh, is, uh, I believe, benefits, benefits everyone. So uh, I offer my support for the project and hope that it move for, moves forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Everybody gets to speak, ma'am. So. And I did a disclaimer that there's more signed up in support, so I'm trying to go back and forth and balance, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Chris, or Chris Hanna, please. I live on the last house on Deerfield Road before it becomes Rochford Road. I've lived there now 21 years. The dust has always been there. If you bought your place, the dust was there when you bought it. That or it was a dirt road. So dust isn't a, can't really be a good logical explanation. You talk about tourism. Tourists go by my house if they want to, they continue on. I watch the people turn around that do. And if they do, they have a nice vehicle. It isn't because they can't drive it. The safety issue. <laughs> the straighter you make a road, the faster people are going to drive it. I live in a quarter mile section that people drive my, by 80 miles an hour because it's a highway. And then they slam on the brakes at the end. So to tell me straightening and fixing a road will lessen the increase of death. I don't believe that. I don't know the science of it. And uh, the financial factors on it, I just don't think are there. He, the highway guy talked about Icebox Canyon and redoing that. I'm willing to bet the bid that he has done constitutes the easiest way he can get by doing it. I don't know the facts, and we can't get into that right now because he's not up here. But if he's choosing the easiest route on how to do these, go through these areas, you're going to come in over budget no matter how you look at it, if there's any problem at all. Even one problem with the way he's got it set up, you're going to be out of budget. Because they, the problem there isn't going to be, it's a lot of rock. It's solid rock on either side on Icebox Canyon. To take the curves out, you got to take whole mountain sides off. And to do that, you're changing the whole creek bed, everything. So I, I just don't see that we're, it's a project that's not going to, once you get it done, five or ten years down the road, you're going to have the same issue. It's going to wash out, and then you're going to even have more expenditure because you have more stuff to fix. You have more layers of asphalt instead of just gravel and rock, where if it washes out right now, you bring in some more rock and gravel, and you can get it going for a little while. It's a canyon. This is a tourist place. People don't want to see a highway and developments. People want to see nature. Yeah, I see my time's about up. So. I allot my time to him. No, that's okay. No. Thank you, sir. Uh, John Marsrek. Sorry if that wasn't even close. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. My name is John Marshak. That was pretty close. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm here uh, as the owner of a business on Deerfield Road. Uh, the, the name of our business is High Country Guest Ranch. And by paving that road that we're all talking about will increase the traffic. One of the things people love about coming to our Ranch is the serenity, the quietness of it. So standing here tonight, you may think that I'm opposed to it. I'm not, I'm in favor of it. It may impact our business negatively. But when you're part of a community, and I'm saying part of the Black Hills community, 
as well as part of the Hill City community, it will impact us with a positive revenue or a higher tax base. So I stand here tonight, um, potentially hurting our own business, but overall, I think we'll improve the economics for Hill City and the surrounding area because it will create a loop for either the cars or the motorcycles. Um, so I would ask that you would not repurpose and that you would go ahead with the project that's been on the books for a number of years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carol Pitts, please. Ms. Carol, okay. Um, Mr. Dan Halsworth. Thank you, Madam President, gentlemen of the board. Appreciate you hearing me. I know you've seen me many times up here. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of specific details as i've referenced before we bought a business also mountain meadow store and campground on deerfield in the anticipation that this road was going to be paved um not the sole purpose i've always stated also i've had a place up there for over 30 years lived here all my life business here in rapid paid taxes all the way through have been very involved in the whole circumstance. The biggest situation with this whole thing is with us and our development with High Country and as the letters that you have received from support from the Hill City Chamber of Congress, the Hill City Town Council, the economic development, um, they're all heavily in support of this for that area because of what it's going to do for the revenue. And everybody looks at the wrong aspects that, yes, we don't want to see what we have for beauty change, but change is inevitable. Uh, I think the biggest thing is, is that we have to do it smartly. And the revenue is going to be a generation to help pay. We've heard maintenance on the road for the gravel is more extreme than what it'll ever be with blacktop safety will be huge on that aspect because you can protect the people with blacktop or blotter top, and I've expressed that also. I think our highway superintendent is very qualified as far as what he expresses on costs. Um, I know some commissioners have been concerned about costs. They've been concerned about PACE law. Um, the agreements that we have with them, they're great neighbors, and then they're going to honor that no different than we're going to honor it. Cost overrun, well, we asked for that several meetings ago. They said, yes, they will put it together. We had the cost analysis up here. It's within reason. So to me, when we're coming through with this kind of support, and I want to thank the people that are opposed also tonight, because we have to hear from everybody. And my only regret is the aspect that the former commissioners that had this in front of them did not get the project done and it's laid on your shoulders. So please don't repurpose it. Let's move forward with the monies that we have in front of us and let's do this project for the safety, beauty, and welfare of the Black Hills. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, no clapping. I know you keep doing that, but <laughs> thank you. We have a Val Miller. Hello, I'm Val Miller. Um, I've lived here all my life in this area, except for 10 years that I served our country in the United States Army. Right now, I watch motorcycles go by. They come, and if they don't like the road, they turn around. Um, people who can ride gravel, ride it. I've rode motorcycles most of my life. I can ride the road in a Harley. If I can do it, a lot of people can do it. Most people don't want to take the road because of cosmetic reasons for their vehicles, whether they're car, truck, or motorcycle. Um, I think this is a big issue now because people do want to line their pockets with extra money, and that's nice. But at what expense? at the expense of the Native Americans, at the expense of our wildlife, at the expense of our water. There are safety issues with the road. But I've drove it also for a long time. I used to work at the VA. And I had to ride it, drive it every night. Winter, summer, doesn't matter. I was able to make it. 
little tiny car. Um, the road's only gotten better since then. Um, yes, the 2008 washout is a big deal. But that area, as my husband stated, is rock on both sides. When it washes out again, what are you going to do? Take out a mountain? Um, had others drawing a blank, I'm sorry. You're okay. I'm kind of emotional about this. I watch people come by from that side of the road, and they're speeding. Um, if we're going to address this, I think we need to look at speed limits for this road. There are lots of wildlife. A paved road's going to only increase the speed and the likelihood of people getting injured hitting wildlife. Um, it's also going to be a detriment with littering. Um, right now, as traffic has ticked up, it's become a mess. Uh, the beauty is being destroyed by people who cannot respect the land. And as the road is paved, we're going to get more of those type of people. I am here to speak for the land, for the animals, for those of us who don't have a voice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Thank you for serving our country as well, Ms. Miller. Is there a Janelle, last name starts with a B? There, Janelle. Um, I guess the best would be Margaret with a P. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret with a P. You're up. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. About to sneak out. <laughs> um, I'm Margaret Perrin, and we own a home at 22904 South Rochford Road. And the points that I would like to largely reiterate is, as a physician, I'm very concerned about the health issues, both for two-legged and four-legged animals. The dust is a real issue. I'm concerned about the safety of the road. But I think economically, it doesn't make sense to turn that money back. Money has already been invested, as we've heard, this is the one shot at getting this road paved. If it's not done now, it's not going to happen. And it just doesn't make sense to repurpose that for something else where you, where you have to go and sort of create a project when this one has been on the drawing board for at least 13 years. So I think, I think it behooves the commissioners to stand by their predecessors and support the decisions they've made. The other concern is that um, you can travel 385, but if something happens to 385, if it's closed, there's no other thoroughfare. And there needs to be a safe alternative, and that road isn't safe. And the engineering that will happen will help to make Icebox Canyon safer, make the other tricky places on the road safer, and it can certainly be done all with the respect of Peace Law. We're right next to Peace Law, and we support what they're doing, and I think the whole thing can be done in a, in a way that is respectful to everybody. But we need it to be safe, and that's the biggest concern. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, <laughs> Ernie Getty, please. Ernie? <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Ernie Getty. I've uh, lived in uh, Rapid Valley for the last 37 years on a gravel road, so I am uh, sympathetic to many of these issues on dust. Um, in 1975, I was fortunate enough to get a job at UPS, and uh, I have delivered in the Rapid City and surrounding area, Central Hills area, uh, for most of that time. Um, I've run into a lot of different road conditions in my truck, uh, all seasons of the year. I know many of these people uh, here, and uh, I'm just trying to give an objective opinion of how I feel. Um, personally, I feel a lot more confident, particularly in bad weather and in the winter, on a gravel road. Um, I feel traction has improved. Um, Blacktop roads, I have found, whether they're rural or in the town, people tend to drive faster. When they get in these gravel road areas, they tend to continue that high rate of speed. When you get into areas like Icebox Canyon, uh, Slate, Slate Creek, and in that area, it's, it's very windy, and you have to respect the roads. And I feel that 
if people would slow down, respect the weather conditions, that gravel will serve them better and be a safer mode of transportation. I sympathize and empathize with the dust. On my road in Rapid Valley, 20 of our neighbors get together and we purchase mag water to mitigate dust damage uh, to livestock and people. Um, I think I'm not totally opposed to spending $8 million, but I think the cost per resident, per taxpayer, would better benefit an area such as Sheridan Lake Road as well. I think we can address the bridge issue an Icebox Canyon with maybe some straightening. It's very narrow. I don't know how timber reduction is going to mitigate that, but I think we could address the ditch, ditch issue, ditch issue um, there, uh, the bridge issue there, and mag water um, along the Native American land and other landowner properties. Um, Sheridan Lake Road is a paved road. It's very shaded. It's very icy in the winter. There are no shoulders. I think if we could utilize some of these funds on that Rochford Deerfield Road and perhaps some to mitigate some of the issues on Sheridan Lake Road would be a benefit to more people. Um, that's, that really sums up how I feel. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lyle with a B. Lyle, there you go. Are you Lyle with a B? I am Lyle with a B. <laughs> My last name is Ben Hyman, and I can understand going with the V. Uh, I grew up uh, north of Wasta, which was black topped uh, out to the Meade County line. Uh, that road got pretty terrible with chuck holes and everything else, and the county actually tore the black top off, ground it up, and used it as gravel. I grew up running on gravel. Uh, my grandparents' house from the gravel road, the Elm Springs gravel road, was the length of this room from the gravel road. There was certainly a lot of dust, a lot of times with cattle trucks and stuff. No one died. The cattle were fine. Horses lived great. A couple of pigs might have bought the big one, I don't know. But as far as a road is concerned, um, if you buy a place and it's on a gravel road, it's going to be on a gravel road probably for years and years and years, and you should know that going in. Um, the uh, uh, last gentleman that just spoke, um, the cost per person to have some dust control, it's ridiculous. The, the people, that, last uh, August 3rd, there was a guy killed on a motorcycle on a blacktop road leaving Rochford. Um, the guys that I know say, if you can't ride a gravel road, don't ride a motorcycle, don't take it up there. The, the, if you can ride a motorcycle and ride it well, you can ride on any conditions. And that's true. Um, I think it's a, a, just a horrible overrun of money. The road that comes from Rochford to 385 is probably by far worse washboardy, nasty, terrible, dusty. Guys on four-wheelers are doing donuts in the road. You can see the tracks. Um, maybe one of the big issues we really need is some patrolling. People out there, uh, they just run rampant because there's no cops out there, and they know it. They just go like the devil. Um, I think it's a huge waste of money. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dan okay, Moose, guys. please. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dan Muth. I own property in the Rochford area. Uh, and we've been up there since uh, about 2000. And uh, when this project came through, apparently it made sense to the commissioners that were on the commission at the time because they're probably in the minutes where they actually made some type of motion to proceed with having the, the delegation get this money. So at some point this road really <coughs> made sense. Well what's changed? What's changed is, is there's a lot more people living in Rochford and the Deerfield area. It, it's never going to be less. 
So the fact that why do we pave roads anywhere? It's because of safety and more traffic and all that. Uh, one, uh, I think the <coughs> county superintendent brought up putting a blotter down. <coughs> you start hauling logs down that road, that blotter's going to be history. You can't haul logging trucks, loads of logs on a blottered highway, blottered road, it's going to tear it up. So I think that's for the cost benefit of blotter versus the asphalt. I really think the extra 700,000 or whatever on that stretch of road would be well worth the money. But I'm uh, really in favor of this road. I think it needs to be done. The whole neighborhood up there has been waiting for this road for years and years and years. And the fact that it's this long in the making kind of represents a misnomer that you can take in the next three weeks and repurpose this money. There's no government entity can repurpose this money in three weeks and meet a July 5th deadline. You got to proceed with this project. Everybody wants this project. Practically everybody wants it. And there's a lot of silent people out there that probably couldn't come to the meeting or whatever. But this project is really needed. You got to keep this thing going forward. Safety, enhancement, more tourist activity. If you read the papers lately, Rochford area is getting inundated with vehicles. And they got to get out of there somehow. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Wayne Hartman, please. Thank you. I'm, uh, my name is Wayne Hartman. I'm a resident of Hill City, and I live just uh, about 100 yards off of the Deerfield Road, and I want to support this project. Um, I cannot believe it hasn't been done yet from all the talk that's been done about it. I think trying to repurpose the money would probably just end up losing it because of the speed of how things have been moving so far. I've talked with at least a dozen of the people that I know in Hill City, and of all the people I've talked to, only one of them has been against this project. Everybody else would like to see it done. And I think it would be a safety factor. I think it would be a tourism plus. I think it'd be an economic plus for Hill City. And I urge you to decide tonight and approve this project and move forward and get it done finally, because it's time. Thank you. Uh, John Burchard. Good evening. My name is John Burkhardt. I'm a local business owner. I uh, own uh, 20 acres a couple miles off of South Rochford Road. I support the paving of South Rochford Road for the following reasons. Number one, safety. It's a very curvy road. Uh, blacktop Road with a center line would be much safer. I drive that road more and more, and I see a lot of people cutting the corners. Uh, Gravel is obviously hard to drive on compared to asphalt. Guardrails with paving would be much safer also. I personally have come upon a number of cars that have ran off the road on the corners, which we've heard a number of other people have also. Number two, maintenance. Uh, gravel is unpleasant to drive on um, when not continuously maintained. Um, I know paving is expensive at first, but I believe the maintenance cost uh, uh, would significantly decrease over time and we'd recoup that money. Number three, environmentally. This road puts up a, uh, a lot of dust in the air, more than any mining or construction site, and we, we regulate that. The paving this road would fix that. Uh, wear and tear on vehicles driving this road would be reduced. There are streams along this road, uh, and for part of it, right next to the road, I've seen during rainstorms that those streams run very silty, very dirty. Uh, paving the road would fix that. 
Uh, lastly, economically, we'd gain another north-south scenic corridor through our beautiful Black Hills. Uh, I actually believe this is more scenic drive than Highway 385. We have the opportunity of making a scenic loop through the hills, which would benefit Hill City, the Lee Deadwood area, and Rochford. I believe it would encourage growth along the corridor. Um, I believe a much larger number of people would use this corridor if it was paved, including bikers, people with convertibles, and just people who don't want to drive gravel roads. I am normally fiscally conservative, but I do believe it's local government's responsibility to spend money to protect its citizens and to promote business growth. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Holly, um, board, is that okay if we take like a five minute break? Sure. Is that okay? Do we have How to? many more we got? How many more? Five minute break. Yeah. Five minute okay board. Do we have to have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Um, the board has asked me to ask everyone if you're going to reiterate um, what everybody else is saying. We appreciate that you want to speak, but um, if you want to give your time to one representative that's saying kind of what you're saying, we appreciate that. Um, we still have about 20 people here so that want to speak. So if you have something um, different than what we've been hearing, we appreciate that. Um, Ma'am. <laughs> Ladies, <laughs> those are women right there, guys. <laughs> Us and quiet don't go together. <laughs> okay, you guys, we Next. need we need to stop the the talking so we can hear. Okay, so um, bottom line is is uh, we appreciate everybody coming. We want to know the support and non-support, and Miss Holly can write that down as well. But if you're going to reiterate the same thing. Um, you know, we understand that, but we're, we're here to hear all voices and we want to know um, anything different than we haven't heard before. So without trying to sound rude to anybody. <laughs> okay, Miss Holly. Okay. Um, Chinupa, please, sir. Ms. Chinup Mr. Chinupa, sorry. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I am Chanupa Gluha Money. I represent uh, Strong Heart Warrior Society. I'm also a member of the uh, Free and Independent Lakota Nation. Um, one of the things that I really wanted to give you real quick, and uh, it's good seeing my, my good friend George here and another brother of mine, uh, Kasai al Haj, and you public, I really appreciate your interest. But there's one thing that you must really keep in mind, okay? And I'm going to bear with me. We're all educated, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> we're all educated, so this is how we're going to do it. Metakipi. Malakhota. Chankukile makhoche he ankata yanke ke he mitho. Natueni hat hok chaki tokata ke woyuk chankile iwogla ka bokipshne. Wolakhota ogna lechun se echanu pikte hata. Oyate mitho ki henat hoke iya yungte. He chanuki. Ta komri wo ki mozi ni chukte. Na he wo ki ki he yanke. Ho. Un kitu e pikle un chima khakile na hakchi oyate iagle api. Cho he un kit khapi. Cho to ha ta ko waste e chanuk te kile echa. Tokel oyate hena iuk yank de hecha. Na le chala ke se washi chi wanji le hiupi na hala khota un insha woglake. Hena toni wak sap ish wo pre ke hena yu hapshni. On kit we pick him a coach, he can kit hoppy. Chehena slowa. Cha ochlate hechus etak on kitch hoke kile woke kihe, yanke na ewaganke. Nilak hotam na hat hoch and kile lo hab hunter. I used stump for him it ho. Hechano shipiki, shichawalakokte. Now, stop. Anyone know what I said in my language? Thank you. You guys have a good day, Neil. Uh, Mr. Jim All Peterson, right. please. Anybody else? Next. Jim Peterson, please. 
Hi there, I'm Jim Peterson from Hill City. Thank you for your time and thanks for having this meeting. Um, I'm a proponent for this project to be done. Um, I'd like to see it be done fiscally responsible. Uh, um, but I, I don't want to, there's a lot of points that everybody's already made. Um, I would just say that there's an overwhelming support in the Hill City area for this project to happen. You've received four letters all uh, from different factions of Hill City. Uh, the Hill City School District voted on it to support this. The Hill City, uh, City of Hill City supports this. The Chamber does, uh, and the Economic Development. And that's a large group of individuals and uh, that are in support of this. And so I, I just want to say that District 1 seems to be, though the people that I've talked to, and that's a lot, um, seem to be in favor of this road being done. And um, there was a promise made, and we think probably the promise should be kept. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Jim. <clears throat> Marvin Kammerer. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Marvin Kammerer. My granddad walked into this territory with an ox train in about 1880 from Fort Pier. We've been camped here ever since on treaty land. And I respect the treaties. I respect the Constitution. The first item here is we have to consider is not how much money one can make. The sacrifice an area, and there's not many of them left, to find in the hills that you can drive and get this feeling that comes right into the heart. You can drive slow, you can drive, enjoy the scenery, but it's like, for me, after a frustrating day, and I've had quite a few, to get in the garden in the evening the frustration come out. And that is the same way of driving this road as it is now. It's not a bad road. I know bad roads. And I've been on it. My brother-in-law went across it twice a week. It's what he's doing now. He lives up there. They run cattle in the hills. If you got dust problems, generally it's because of speed. It's cheaper to put up sheriff or deputy out there and let him have a little fun picking up people that like to speed. We have the same problem in Meade County. Not pay taxes in this county, too. It's a terrible way to operate. Enforce the law. Slow them down. That's what makes the dust. Fix the bridge if it needs fixing. Leave the road alone. And as curves, straighten it out, don't make any difference. But in anything you get to hill, people have no respect. When they've drove new roads, they just bang. They want to get here from this <coughs> point here to that point. And that's the whole thing behind this thing is the Chamber of Commerce of Hill City and probably this city want to commercialize and cannibalize, I think, the land. They want to California is the whole damn hills. It's the most beautiful piece of the area out in a, what some people refer to as a desert. It isn't going to hurt us to keep a little bit of what is good for this country and respect the native people. You've got all kinds of places to spend this money. We've been, I've been to every one of these meetings, not just here, but Fine. in other countries, in other counties. And I'm sick and tired of coming here and having to listen to the same old BS every damn time I know where it's going. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ken Davis, please. <coughs> Mm. 
Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Ken Davis, and I'm not too sure I want to identify myself coming up here tonight. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of rotten tomatoes in the background because I'm the sucker that started this whole affair. <laughs> the only reason I did it is because my constituents wanted it done that way. And they called me about the dust problem for health reasons and their families, and some of them had um, asthma and things like that, and that was part of the situation. They also brought up with our uh, gentleman here that was the uh, veterinarian, uh, dust pneumonia and livestock, and that was the problem. Also the problem, the erosion and things on the, on the property and around the, around the roads and how much money it was costing to uh, maintain it. And um, they asked to have this blacktopped. I'm the guy that went to Washington, D.C., not on the county's dime, not one dime was spent on this project before I went to Washington and after I went to Washington, and, uh, but the county didn't spend any money on that. The only thing that we did is Heidi Jungi and I talked about this, and we talked about how much it was going to take, what kind of road we wanted to put, and the plans for it. I took those to Washington and delivered them to our senators at that time. They thought it was a great idea. I think it's a great idea, and I think it's time that we proceed with it. Um, the, the safety factor is one, one of the things, and, this, and the economic development from Hill City to the Lawrence County line, which is blacktopped on the way into this, the northern hills. And uh, I think it's an excellent situation for economic development. I think it's a safety issue. I think we can bring some motorcyclists in up there. We can just separate the traffic off three, three roads through the Black Hills instead of two. And that's one of the reasons I'm here for it. So I'm open to any questions you have. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Nancy. Nancy Hilding, please. Are you starting? Um, <laughs> all right, uh, Nancy Hilding, I'm president of Prairie Hills Audubon Society. Um, we have been opposed to this pro project since uh, 2012 and speaking against it and commenting against it. Um, we, would, we would like to reiterate, you want me to be quick, we share the cons Native American concerns for PESLA. Um, if the Supreme Court said that this was a theft. We were not alive in 1877, but we're alive now. And we can take action to respect their sacred site. Um, we would like to point out um, that, um, I, I need to pull up my notes here. Um, Petla is a montane grassland. The Nature Conservancy recognized it as one of 43 very special ecological areas in the Black Hills. But a lot, a, a, my 30 some percent of it is actually on the Forest Service. The, the montane grassland, it isn't all uh, in Native American ownership and, and there's still private land out there that is not in Native American ownership and it's not in Forest Service ownership. Um, so if we, we are concerned that this road will bring more people into the parts of Petla that are not controlled by the Native Americans. Um, we are concerned about the impacts to the montane grassland. We're concerned about the road fragmenting elk, mule deer, white-tailed deer, uh, American martin habitat. We're concerned about water quality impacts. Um, I, as I understand it, the bridge will be built no matter what. So when we oppose this, we're not opposing the bridge. Um, but we, we, we believe that you're going to bring more tourism, more people, particularly into Pesla, like motorcycles driving through Pesla during the summer with all of their noise. Um, so, so we think that the, the, increase, the, the paving of the road will bring a lot more people into this area and impact wildlife and Native American and a rare montane grasslands. And before I, how much time do I have left? It's all. You don't have a specific timer, Nancy. Oh, all right, okay. So um, the, 
I'm a, I'm a member, I'm not an officer of the Rapid City. You have 30 uh, seconds. Rapid City chapter of the Isaac Walton League, but the president is out of town at a funeral. And um, I gave to you the Isaac Walton League's um, opposition from 2012, April 4th meeting. It was approved and it was presented at the April 19th meeting in Hill City to the county. It raises concerns about fragmentation of big game habitat and um, effects I'm to, well, I'm get to water quality. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you, you very much. I appreciate thank you for coming, Ms. Nancy. And you're a very nice chair. You're a very good chair. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Nancy. <laughs> Next. Uh, Lauren Eggert. Okay. Lauren left. Was he for or against? Does it say? Uh, he for? marked both. <laughs> he was for? Okay. Uh, is there a Paul? Are you Paul? <laughs> <laughs> you're Paul? Paul. Hello, I'm Paul Larson. I live on 22894 South Rochford Road, one of the problem corners. When I moved out uh, to Rochford or to that area there, um, I moved because it was a gravel road. I moved because it was way out in the middle of nowhere, and I wanted to get it away from society. But society found me anyways. They've been coming by every day more than 33, and uh, not only noise, but uh, the dust, like people have been saying. For me, no one appreciates the Black Hills or the, the outdoors as much as I do. I can ride my horses up to the top of Whitetail Peak and sit there for hours. I can go to Flag Mountain and I can pray just like anybody else, and I love it. It's a wonderful place to be. The thing is, I have grandchildren now, and it's not just me. And these vehicles come by, it doesn't matter if it's blacktop or gravel, 100 miles an hour, seems like. I've pulled, I don't know, countless cars out of the ditch right there by Lucy Ganges, just across the road from me. When they come down that hill, they, they hit that corner, and they don't get the fact. I actually bought my own children's at play signs, probably illegal, but I'm going to put them up. <laughs> on my fences so that people pay attention to what's going on there. I think financially I was for and against this project because I'm for it for, for all the right reasons. When I drive to Deerfield or I drive to Deadwood on the blacktop, it's just as pristine as if it was gravel. But it's safer for me, I believe. Uh, I don't want to have to buy a license from my ice house, but if I have to, I will to pull it on a blacktop road. I think that um, the majority of the mood of, of my neighbors would like to see this project proceed, uh, even at the risk of higher taxes, which we already pay high taxes, but here we go again. So I think that uh, the people that are on, at Peshla, who I neighbor to, and I love that place, I love their manager, I grazed my horses there last year. When I get out in the middle of Peshla, I understand how spiritual it really is. Uh, it's a great place to be. It, you can find a deeper person in yourself there. So in the process of you making your decision, I hope and pray that you move forward with this road and we can just have a better life all the way around. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. Holly. <coughs> um, <coughs> Sue Schwenicke. Miss Sue. Hi there. I'm Sue Schwanicky. I'm a Rochford resident. Uh, I have property on South Rochford Road, and I was a member of the Public Steering Committee for this project. Many of the arguments for the project have already come out, but there were a couple of things that I wanted to I don't know if people realize what went into this project. The road is not being changed directionally. There is no new road being cut. Um, the committee was very, very aware that we wanted to lower the footprint there. Um, it's, it's going to be improved, not straightened. Uh, as far as maintenance, 
Right now, that road, one of the main reasons for even looking at it is that it costs about $8,000 a mile to maintain as it is. The cost later, the cost after paving will be half of that. The cost for paving a typical gravel road in Pennington is much less than that, too. Um, as far as the traffic, I can tell you I was out on South Rochford Road on Memorial Day uh, helping my cousin paint, and I counted over 100 ATVs going by in less than two hours. So we're not capturing all the traffic there. And when we approve the bridge, we're going to be allowing those bigger trucks to come across. That is going to make the road dust horrible, and it's going to destroy the road. As far as Icebox Canyon, the S-curve, I can tell you that they are not, when they plow it, they're doing the best they can, but they're not going down to the gravel because they want to save the gravel. It is icy, and people have already talked about that. People who live on Van Acker when they got it paved were worried about it, and after it was done, they said they don't know why they waited so long. Um, as far, you know, somebody asked me to make the comment, you know, if we've heard there's always been gravel roads out there. But then again, at one point, pop, people always said, well, we always had outhouses, but we fixed that. Um, it's been 12 years. The people have waited for a very long time for this promise to be kept. The people out there are taxpayers, and they really deserve to have this road. It will need to get done somehow. Do it now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Holly? Is there a Dale with an H? Dale with an H? That's one that's pretty unreadable for me. We'll save that. Um, uh, Mr. Ken Moss? My name's Ken. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name's Ken Moss. I've been a resident of this area for quite a few years. I uh, spent my Air Force time out here at Ellsworth. Of course, I used to hunt this area. I used to drive all the back roads, and especially up around Rochford and across to Deerfield. Uh, you know, I speak in opposition to this for four simple reasons. Uh, number one, they're going to narrow that road for the blacktop. They're going to narrow it about four to six feet in areas that now is gravel that run clear out. In fact, uh, just to read, do my memory, I drove it yesterday just to make sure I could remember what the heck was going on. Uh, the fellow here talked about the traffic count it was 30 to 80. Uh, <laughs> one of the reasons I'm in opposition, we could use that money to uh, repurpose 385 to Rochford. You go out there and you can count about 60 cars an hour up and down that road, and they still slide off the road there. They run in a ditch. You got the four-wheelers and the dust and everything else. You don't seem to have that much argument out there. But, you know, if we blacktop that road, just like 44 West, you're going to have that uh, calcium chloride dust and that's a lot more of a health hazard than the regular dirt dust is. So I oppose this for the simple reason. The calcium chloride will tear up the animal's uh, nostrils and their lungs, along with the human beings. As far as that washout is concerned that we've all seen a while ago, it's going to have to be repaired no matter what you do. Now, they're either going to have to put a concrete embutment in there or, or something, so the cost there is negligible, whether it's blacktop or gravel. Uh, and as far as people running off the road, you're not going to stop that. You're going to blacktop that thing. It's going to be like 44. It's going to become a racetrack. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. Um, How many do we have left, Miss Holly? Four, five, six, and I think two more that I can't read. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Miss Holly. Next. And Richer. Did he leave? Okay. Uh, Jay Davis.
Good evening, Madam Chairman, members of the Commission. I'm here to speak in favor of repurposing the money and in opposition to paving the road. Um, I was privileged to move here 43 years ago and almost immediately appreciated the unique scenic beauty of the Black Hills. At that time, there were no paved roads inside a perimeter that went from Lead Deadwood to Hill City to Custer to Newcastle and back. There's been a lot of paving of roads since then, and a lot of areas have been opened up and developed. Um, Peshla, also known as Reynolds Prairie, is not my church, but I do respect the people whose church it is. And when I first saw it, I realized that this was something really special, even within the greater beauty of the, of the Black Hills. Um, I guess... Literally, it means the bald spot within the forest, and as I've aged, I've come to respect bald spots. <laughs> um, that road is not in bad condition. And just to make sure that I wasn't dreaming, I went up there about a week ago, and that's a very well-maintained gravel road. If you're having trouble with it, slow down is what I would say. Because if you believe that that road is poorly maintained or in bad condition, then you believe that every gravel road in the country is in bad condition. I cringe when I hear the talk about an alternative to 385 and all the bikers that are going to come zooming up there during the rally. This is a special place, and we ought to be able to leave one part of the Black Hills undisturbed the way so much of the hills was in the past. Allegedly, the former highway superintendent said once this road was completed that Reynolds Prairie could be a sea of houses. I don't know if he really said that, but that makes me cringe as well. Um, growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of the cancer cell. If we're going to be fiscally conservative, if we're going to do the right thing for the taxpayers of Pennington County, those funds should be repurposed to roads that get a lot more traffic and we should leave Reynolds Prairie, Peshla, in the heart of the hills alone. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Ms. Holly? Uh, Deborah Whitman? Hi. Hello, my name is Deborah Whitman. I'm a resident of Deerfield, South Dakota. And when I leave my house, I have to take a dirt right of way through the National Forest to a logging road, to a gravel road, West Deerfield, which comes out to South Rochford and Deerfield Road. In the winter, if I make a left turn off of that gravel road, I slide for a mile uphill till I reach that gravel spot and then get traction again. So the roads that are paved in the area are not safer than the gravel roads. And every road off of either of those roads are all gravel roads. So when does that end on where to pave? I'm also a member of the Black Hills chapter of Bikers Against Child Abuse. And we do a lot of rides where people from all our surrounding states come to join us for child rides or for, to go to court. And 90% of the people that come into this area on motorcycles have never taken a turn and a hill at the same time, whether it's up or down. And you can go too slow uphill and dump your bike just as bad as you can go too fast downhill. So the inexperienced of the surrounding states, which is the main people that use motorcycles in this area, don't need another deadly road for them to travel on. And I ride, and I take that road, but we ride gravel all the time. These people don't ha ever take a turn or a hill. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dever. Thank you. Uh, Vic Alexander. And Doug Patton has waived his three minutes to Vic. Hi. I don't even really know where to begin. i kind of two-sided on the thing. I... I uh, one side, uh, being a biologist uh, by education, I can see there, you know, there's pluses and minuses both ways. I think I'd have to start off by saying, kind of like <clears throat> Paul Larson, that uh, my particular family is the seventh generations in the Black Hills. So uh, that's my great great grandparents were here in uh, the 1870s. Um, a lot of, I have about 100 relatives in Hill City. Uh, all of them are for it. 
I can, uh, a good portion of them live on Reynolds Prairie and in the Deerfield area. They're all for it. Um, I've been in the fire service in Hill City for uh, since, uh, or for 38 years. Uh, I've been up and down Deerfield Road from one end to the other, picking up people and scooping up, you know, people and accidents and that sort of thing. I think that you got to drive on whatever kind of road surface it is that you need to drive on. Um, <clears throat> I think though that uh, in the winter time, I do know that the blacktop roads, uh, we might say that if they're properly maintained, just like they do in Colorado or any big mountain states, those blacktop roads are just as safe as driving on gravel. Uh, we throw gravel on top of it to be get better traction, but uh, not to get off on, on any one subject. I had about 20 of them to cover, but uh, I think there's pluses and minuses both ways. I think for paving, uh, the part from Hill City to out to where it's been paved right now has actually been part of five paving projects that I know of, five different projects from Hill City out to the north side of Deerfield where it is right now. It took five projects and 50 years to get it that far. I reckon it's the same type of thing from leading Deadwood South. They probably spent five, six, eight, who knows how many paving projects. Those guys probably weren't making good decisions either, but we'd expect that you guys would be making good decisions, you know, just to match up the last eight or 10 miles. It seems like a logical thing to do. It's unfortunate that uh, it does go through a church and there's nobody that respects the Black Hills and the nature in the Black Hills as much as I do and or as much as our friends at Peshla. I've got a lot of friends, a lot of association with that. It's the best thing that's ever happened in the Black Hills, in the, North, in the Central Hills. So it, we can all be neighbors, I think, and do that, but at the same time, uh, not, not with any jest, but I don't think it's a bad idea to put a new carpet in the church once in a while. You know, that's all this is gonna be is a, a blacktop surface that is not going to change substantially the fact that it's still a road. Is it going to get used more? Yes, I think that it probably will. Uh, good, bad, or indifferent, it's, uh, uh, the idea is it's going to be safer from the dust standpoint. Uh, I don't know about eating dust versus sodium, uh, sodium chloride, but uh, as far as eating sodium chloride, I don't think we put a lot of sodium chloride in the, in the, in the mix anymore anyway. But there's, uh, let me look at my notes here. Um, I think that the paving projects, all of the, the projects that were done previously and the road corridor that runs all the way through there is a, a, a notion that we're going to be paved. I'm not quite a, as good a storyteller as Paul is, but inevitably it is going to be paved. And uh, I don't know whether it's going to be paved now. I don't think it's a never, never. I don't think we can make a decision that's never going to be paved if we don't do it right now. But I think now, or eight years or 10 years ago, was a good time to have done it. I think it should have been done before now. Um, I think that uh, I've been on the EDC in Hill City since 1983, since it formed in 1983. Um, again, going back to a lot of people being supportive of it, uh, the Hill City community, uh, the Rochford community, by and large, there are individual good friends of mine that have opposition to it. Um, it is what it is. I, I, I try to get my arms around the whole bigger picture, and for me, that bigger picture is, is go ahead and finish the project. It was originally designed. We're using federal dollars. We talk about being a burden to the taxpayer of Pennington County. Uh, that is true to the extent of the overrun uh, and 20%, but I believe that 80% of the monies that have already been committed are Fed monies, right? So, and they are what they are, and it is a federal project. It, it qualifies for that, that type of a status. So, yes, we are going to do that. I think that the overrun, if you amortize it backwards in the savings and maintenance on a gravel road versus a blacktop road that's new built and designed to last for 40, 50 years, I think you're going to find out the amortization backwards. You're going to pay for that overrun in a few short years anyway. But my questions before of George was, I don't know, has anybody's done that study? Have you done that study? Has anybody gone through and run that out to find out at what point that breaks? So I think there is the economies of, of doing it outweigh the, the, the bad things that are of not doing it, and I'm totally in support of the, of the project. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything here.
No, I think I got the ones I scratched down the last five or ten minutes anyway. So <laughs> I am overwhelmingly in favor of of, proj of of finishing the project that was originally designed. And, and uh, I'm still going to go to Sheridan Lake, and we're still going to scoop people up, whether it's motorcycles or cars, we're still going to get them out of the ditch and pick up the people that are hurt and take them in an ambulance to Rapid City. I mean, that's going to... That's going to be, you know, no matter what. So, thank thanks. you, sir. Is there a Dan with a R? Looks like R A S U. Is there a Dan out there that hasn't spoke? <laughs> okay. Um, is there a Carl or Carol Jefferson? Carol. Did they or leave? Carl. <clears throat> Okay. No, Carl? Gone. <laughs> okay. Um, so it looks like the last one is going to be Cheryl Wetham. Miss Cheryl, are you here? That's the last I have that I can read. Anybody else want to speak that hasn't been able to speak on this issue? That's in the audience today. And just state your name, sir, if you would. My name is Brian Harvey. I uh, own property on the South Rochford Road. Uh, you've heard from my relatives. Uh, I don't need to repeat their concerns. Uh, in the current setup, the road uh, drains onto my property, has buried the fence five feet over the years with all the gravel and uh, debris coming down the road in its present, <clears throat> in its present condition it's it's still doing that the water flows onto my property I'm a um, hobby beekeeper I have beehives off the road they get dusted all the time it's unhealthy for them um, I, I'm in support of paving the road uh, I don't like the traffic as it is I'm sure we're gonna have more traffic but uh, in its present condition it's just it's not adequate they need to do something with it and if you can't do that I'd like you to vacate the road and give me the acre of the right-of-way that crosses my property back. <laughs> thank you <laughs> anybody else that hasn't spoke uh, you, sir this one first and then you sir you're gonna speak first we'll let That'd be you. <laughs> I thought I signed a form when I came in saying I wanted to speak. Yep, what's your name? Huh? What's your name, sir? Whatever. No, what's your name? My name Please. is Jim Bell. Thank you. And I uh, have lived in Rapid City since 1954. Much of that time I was in the business as a civil engineer. And uh, during those years and since, I volunteered a lot of my personal time to the improvement of this community in the general Black Hills area. I think that uh, it's time that some of the, or I did think at one time, I think we've made some improvements, but uh, we, uh, we need to catch up with the rest of the country in some respects. Now we got a lot of gravel roads around here. The cost of maintaining a gravel road, the replacement of the uh, gravel or crushed rock on it, associated with it, is not, is not free. It is expensive. So you might just as well get started with a project where you've already got some money rather than turning it back to some other area, get on with it and start this project. I, I think it's inconceivable that this is, that somebody's thinking about turning back the money. That's the reason that uh, I found when I was on the uh, a chairman of the Highway and Transportation Committee in the Rapsay Chamber of Commerce that uh, 
Well, the answer was we don't ever pay, fix any roads or spend any money in the west part of Pennington County because we just don't have the money. All right, now we got some money, and let's put it to good use. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Thank you. Sir? You'd state your name, sir. Gary Sabers. Up at the mic, Mr. Sabers, if you would. Yep. Thank you, sir. I'm Gary Sabers, and we have property that the Rochford Road goes between our, we got property on both sides for a little bit, and we've had that for about 25 years. And same as Paul Larson, that was our kind of pristine getaway, and the last 10 years, I mean, the traffic has gotten better, busier, excuse me, and things have gotten worse out there. I mean, as far as traffic, the, the road really does need to be improved. It does need to happen. It was money that was earmarked for that, made in Congress. I mean, to repurpose it, in my opinion, is wrong. To take money that was made for a project, earmarked for a project, and just try to go put it someplace else. Please be the board that is responsible and takes the money that it was made for use. And let's move forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else we miss in the audience that would like to speak? This is your time to speak, because after this, then the board will have discussion. So if you missed your chance, okay. We'll go ahead and close the discussion of the public testimony, and now it would be the board discussion. Uh, Commissioner LaCroix. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I'd like to thank our staff for getting this all studied. We got some that are going on 14 hour shift today and from yesterday, so it, your, your work's definitely appreciated. And I want to appreciate all the folks who came here tonight and took up your whole evening to, to share not only the history uh, of Rochford Road, but also your concerns for the pros and the cons. And also, I want to express some of my respect for my fellow commissioners. You know, we, we a couple of weeks ago, uh, threw out the idea of repurposing and sent a letter to Congress and had discussions with Joel, and we did that. And I was for that out of respect for my commissioners. They had some concerns, and they thought there might be some other ways to go around, and so I supported them with their concerns. Although I've always supported Rochford Road being completed because I think it's been a long time work. You know, we, we talk about waste in, in government and we've had the EPA tr getting dragged on and this has been drug, drug on for a long time. And I really believe, as someone had said, you know, this can be the north-south corridor for the Black Hills and I think we need to move forward with it. And I think, you know, we get, we talk about, I've heard some talk about, it's a waste of our federal money, so we should repurpose it somewhere else. Well, in all reality, the people that are gonna be using it, it's everybody's money. We get two to three million visitors to the Black Hills annually to Mount Rushmore. So, I mean, when I go to another state, federal funds have put in those roads, I use those roads, the money's used for that. So, I'm in support of this project. And there's been some concerns about whether we should make a decision tonight or move or postpone it. And I'm not for postponing it anymore. You know, so I don't know if I should. No, 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 please, please don't. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're trying to move forward here. We want to be respectful to everybody. So um, you normally, after you speak, you don't make a motion. But... I'm, I'm going to do that. Lloyd, I'm, I'm going to have you hold on the motion okay. and let everybody speak first. Thank you. Um, commissioners? Commissioner DeSanto. I appreciate everybody coming and sharing their, their thoughts on this uh, project. And I hear a lot about safety, safety, safety. Um, we had a gentleman get up here that probably averages 100,000 miles a year when he was driving for UPS. I average about 30,000 miles a year driving in my normal occupation on all kinds of road, both gravel and paved. Um, 
So let's start, let's talk about safety. In my opinion, just my opinion. But uh, if we pave that road, we will have greater traffic use. There will be a lot more traffic on that road, without a doubt. With pavement goes higher speeds. There's going to be more wild, more vehicle wildlife collisions with those higher speeds. The it's been my experience with the number of miles that I've driven, and I was also, um, I have 13 years of truck driving experience as well, um, hauling anything from cattle to flatbeds to logs to uh, freight. And it's been my experience that you have less traction on pavement than you do on gravel in most cases, unless you're driving up and on the northern border of Canada where the, the snow's packed down six feet high. Um, I believe that, that that road does need guardrails. I've driven the road several times, um, just recently, uh, last Monday. I believe that it could benefit by guardrails. Um, that would make it safer. Um, it could benefit by speed limits posted more often on that road, and that would make it safer. I am a motorcyclist. I'm also a classic car enthusiast. Um, but I feel that the Black Hills offers plenty of riding and driving right now as it is. Uh, I don't necessarily think we need to develop anymore. So I, uh, with all due respect to the proponents of paving this road, I believe that the money could be used and better spent on other projects that are more of a immediate need as opposed to a want. And uh, as a commissioner, I think it boils down to prioritizing um, where we spend our money in this county. So thank you. Mr. Buskud. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, very difficult question. I've heard a couple of people complain about my statement once about giving the money back to the federal government instead of doing projects. Well, we're going to, this country better start doing some of that stuff because we're trillions of dollars in debt. And if we keep being greedy and spending money, we're going to get worse. Anyway, this problem. Uh, I'm not going to gain any fans with this either, but uh, the Black Hills is the most densely populated national forest in the United States. And now we want to build another road through it to get more development and more people and uh, right through the middle of the Black Hills. I'm not sure at all if it's going to add much economic development to Hill City. There's only so many bikers, I think they all find their way down to Hill City, the ones that want to without opening another road to get down there. I think we need to fix the bridge, we need to fix Icebox Canyon, and we need to do something about the dust. And I guess if I had my choices, I would suggest we uh, put a blot on that road to try to cut the dust down, do some ma calcium mag water if we have to. And I would really like to rezone the whole area along both sides of the road so we can't have any development on there at all anymore. I don't know if that's possible, probably not. But I think uh, we are developing the beautiful Black Hills to the extent that we're ruining it. Thank you, Mr. Busker. Mr. Verby. Can I ask my question now of the highway superintendent? Yes, sir. <clears throat> How are we going to straighten Ice Box Canyon out? Uh, there's an the <clears throat> intimation that we can straighten it out. <clears throat> can, you, can you tell me how? I have not said that we're going to straighten it. I have said that we're going to do what we can to make it safer. I have not said we're straightening it. There are ways we can improve that road. How? I'm sure uh, to make it safer, 
we can get the super elevations correct through there. We can, you talked about railing, that's a good way to do it. That can help a lot. There are other things that we can do. I would have to sit down and really study it. So why are you just now telling us that? That there are ways. George, stop. No. That's he's I not just never, now telling us that. I have never that. said nope. we're going to straighten it. I'm sorry. Okay. I will. George, you said that. <clears throat> so let's don't put words in his mouth. If you're asking <clears throat> questions, we appreciate that. The intimation was made that we're going to straighten the road out, and and whoever's telling the, the my constituents and the, almost all these folks are my constituents, by the way. Almost everybody that's spoken tonight is my constituent. Okay. For all no. our constituents, thank you, George. <clears throat> thank it's you. A, it's a hairpin. It's a hairpin. 180, a sharp 180 degree turn. How are we going to straighten that out? There's no way to straighten it completely out because of the of the channel, of the of the canyon. Yeah. We still have to follow the canyon. So he's not saying straighten, George. You are. What he's saying is make it safer. So you've you've reiterated the straightening, sir. So what he's telling you is how to make it safer. Yeah. Thank you, George. Go ahead. Well, if it's my turn, bottom line is until somebody can give me an estimate, an estimate of what it's going to cost to make that road safer, then I can't vote either way. Secondly, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, until somebody gets me a piece of paper that says that that road, 1.8 miles, 1.7 miles, whatever it is, through Pace Law, that that road is ours in perpetuity, I can't vote yay or nay either. Our agreement, I think if somebody got up and said our agreement, is not worth the papers written on. And I agree with that. Thank you, George. Um, no offense, but that was your lawyer, George, and um, they, uh, <laughs> they uh, when he said that, um, Department of Interior is the federal government, and if you read that agreement, um, and it was said at the city council meeting, they reiterated that again from that agreement, and by the way, that was five tribes, guys, five native tribes that agreed with this document. So when people think we're being disrespectful, we were very respectful to the Native people. We listened to five different tribes that told us that this agreement would work and that they were okay with us going through that road and that they would give us that right away. And to say they're going to shut it down and do all this, well, anybody can do that and stop a lot of people from different roads anywhere. So I think that's disrespectful to just say, contemplate that these native people are just going to be disrespectful to us and shut this down anytime because they're native people and this is their road that's disrespectful they have been above and beyond on this agreement with us and you could say it doesn't count but they have been meeting with us still and actually we are meeting with a lot of the native tribes around the surrounding South Dakota to try to find some agreements with them that would work so we can help them on many things, not just this. So we have been very respectful in Pennington County and they have been very respectful to us. So to think we're gonna disrespect or we're gonna touch their land and do something to their land that we aren't going to do, we have an agreement. Again, it's five tribes that signed this agreement. So we, we, are, we are totally respecting what they want. They are in this agreement. Miss Alice Whitebird, she is the environmental scientist in this NEPA. And if this board would read this, that's why there was a 13-year promise and a NEPA study done. If you agreed for 13 years and everybody in that area thought for 13 years this was going to get done and Pace Law came into this knowing this was all going to happen, they knew this was going to happen beforehand. So. You're telling me now that all of this study and everything doesn't mean anything to anybody that wants this road done? And the ones that don't want it done? It means nothing to you. And, and why did all the commissioners, and why did we have all these people do all this work if, if the Hill City and the Chamber and the people in that area, most of them, didn't want it? 
because it would have been shut down. I've been in politics long enough. If that's what was going to happen, it would have been shut down. You can say safety, but did you read this? Do you know exactly that gravel because you drove on it because you're a UPS guy? Do you have the statistics that this has? Did you do the study? No disrespect to anybody driving on gravel. Did you do the study? Did you do the fen study? Did you do the heave study? Did you do the icebox canyon study? Did you do the bridge study? This is a lot of work to say, oh, now guess what? We're going somewhere else. Your 13 years didn't mean anything to us. And your representative, he doesn't know which way to go now. Okay, when I said it was a no-brainer, I meant it that way because it's $7 million that they're going to put towards a road that was promised to many of those people out there. Because of the dust, because of the road. I totally respect the people that don't want it in, in the sense that we need to leave it like it is for the future. But the road, a man just said it, and that's what made sense to me. It's still pristine. It's still nice. It's still awesome. When they paved my road, I didn't say, oh, now it's ugly out there. Now the dust is going to have some problems. I like it dusty. I like it paved. I like it whatever. What I did, and, and people know me, I read the facts. I read this book, I read this book, and I read this book. And to a couple of commissioners, that means nothing. It's because we don't want to develop it. Then you should have stopped them, because that's a lot of work for nothing. Madam Chair. So, no, I'm going to finish. I'm going to call a point of order because you're accusing us of not caring, and we do care. It's not that you don't care. We're but basing our decisions work. on what we feel. There's five commissioners on this board. Five well, commissioners. I appreciate we all have that. Our, and that's why there's five commissioners. Yes, but if you read this, Mr. DeSanto, no offense, then what your concerns were were the opposite of what the study was. And that's all I'm saying. It's not that you don't care. Everybody up here became a commissioner for a reason. But I'm asking you, if you read the study and the safety and the gravel and everything that this has been done, that's why it, it's a, it becomes very sad for me when people don't read their stuff. Or I'm sorry, that's not fair either. No, not. People read it. People read it. But if you read it thoroughly and you understood what they wrote, this is the Department of Transportation. This isn't the city of... Uh, Pennington County's engineer that put this together. These are people that have been doing this a long time. And we know better because we think the pristine breast, the Black Hills and free, I've been here all my life. I totally believe what you guys are saying. I totally believe what you're saying. But then I wish it would have stopped and not put this on our shoulders. It should have been stopped. If this was this much opposition, this should have been stopped. That's what makes me the saddest. And not that these people don't do the work, because they do. It just makes me sad that other people did it, and some of the people weren't here. Why didn't you go 13 years? That's a lot of commissions. That's a lot of department transportation people that are believing that we are moving forward. And to, to, to take it in, and, and people, Guys, I'll keep saying the tribes, the 13 years, the repurposing of funds is nonsense. I'll make a motion to adjourn. No, we're not going to adjourn, George. Second. You can make a motion. I will second that motion. And that takes prior priority over all the other motions. Let's vote on it. That's disrespectful, but you guys want to vote on it, go ahead. There's a motion and a second to adjourn. Is All that, in favor say aye. Is, is that debatable? I don't know. It's not. Nope. 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 Not. Let's vote. Ron? What? Do you want to adjourn? <laughs> I see no, no purpose in continuing to argue. Yes. Aye. Are we doing a roll call vote? Is that what yes. we're doing here? Yes. Yes. DeSanto? Aye. Farabee? Yes. LaCroix? No. Adcock. Aye. Or no, sorry, no. no. We're adjourned. Motion, we're adjourned.